London is a city steeped in history and brimming with culture. From Georgian gems and eclectic cottages to Victorian retreats and colorful flats, London is home to some of the most captivating and creatively curated spaces in the world. Join us as we journey through the iconic streets of this vibrant city to explore the homes of some of London's top tastemakers. Enjoy! Hi, I'm Allison Kenworthy, the founder of Homeworthy, and we're now offering a membership plan that gives our supporters early and exclusive access to new videos. Hi, Homeworthy. I'm Roz. You're here at my home in Los Angeles? Come on in, I can't wait to show you around. With this membership, we invite you to open more doors, discovering new homes, rooms, and personalities available only to those with the keys to our guest house. You'll be part of a community of people who are just as passionate as you are about interior design. To access all of this exclusive content, simply click the Join button below to become a member today. You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Hi, Homeworthy. My name is Ambrose. Welcome to our home in the English countryside. Can't wait to show you around. Come on in. You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Like and subscribe for more. Hi, my name is Ambris Miller, and we are in Suffolk in the UK. Um, we are at our home um, that has origins of the 17th century. So I am originally from Birmingham, Alabama, uh, born and bred. My family, from as far back as we can trace, are from Alabama. Um, but I actually moved to the UK about 13 years ago. It was right after college. Um, I went to Davidson College in North Carolina and I started working for Bank of America um, in Charlotte, which is only about 20 minutes away from Davidson. And there was an opportunity to move to London for a project. And I remember saying to my boss at the time, uh, put me in coach, I, I wanna go to the I wanna go to London, I wanna go to the UK. Um, it was really because I had traveled abroad when I was at Davidson and we had about two weeks in London and fell in love with the art, history, culture, and I was dying to get back. So the first opportunity that presented itself with the bank at the time, uh, I jumped at it. And 13 years later, here we are. So we are in Suffolk in the UK. So we're in England. It's what in the region called East Anglia. Um, and it's a wonderful part of the countryside. Um, so we are about an hour and a half by train um, into London or from London. Um, I drive or take the train into London probably about two or three times a week. So it's pretty accessible from that perspective, but we're in a beautiful little village um, just outside of Barry St. Edmunds and I absolutely adore it. It's funny because whenever my friends from back home in Alabama come to visit or friends or family, they say, you move 3000 miles away just to move back home. Um, and that's really because it, the village definitely has a kind of an Alabama feel to it, kind of a small town, slower pace, especially outside of London. Um, and it also means that you are able to get a bit more for your money than if you were to live in London. Our home has origins from the 17th century. Um, you, it starts from the back, uh, so about 1650 is when the original foundations were laid. Foundations, it's, it's kind of built on earth <laughs> because there weren't such things as foundations back then. Um, and it's kind of a bit higgly piggly towards the back of the house. And as you move forward to the front of the house, that's when you see slightly larger proportion rooms 
um, a slightly higher ceilings. And again, that's just because as the families, as generations continued on that lived here, had more and more money, they would upgrade or effectively add on an extension towards the front. And so the most modern part of the home is the actual, the front, which is a bit of a Georgian um, exterior. I live in our home with my husband, Ben, uh, and our 18-month-old little boy named Hendrix, and our two dogs, Theo and Edison. So we are in the foyer. So the way the house is built is that it runs, it has two long hallways that runs from the front to the back of the, of the house, um, on the top and then the bottom as well. And then all of the rooms go off of those um, hallways, which is really nice because it means that when you open your front door, you can see all the way through the back if I don't close this divider door. Um, but this foyer, we really just want it to have a bit of a punch when you first walk in. We also want it to complement these original tiles, these Victorian tiles. But I like to say that this is kind of like the religious hallway um, uh, as we move into the foyer just because I have some of my religious paintings up. I'm obsessed with anything Italian Renaissance or anything Italian or co really continental European religious studies. So uh, that's just my background in art and art history. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to have is a focal point, and we ummed and awed about this the entire time, is having this Sputnik, this Murano Sputnik chandelier. It's probably the one thing that I had to really convince my husband on um, because of this size of it and as you can see it's, it's not the biggest space when you walk in um, certainly compare it to some of the homes I've seen in America where they have 20 foot ceilings we don't have that there we don't have that here rather um, but what I think that this does is it adds a bit of contemporary flair but also a focus on that artisan and craftsmanship uh, which I think is so integral um, to any any piece but the funny part about this is that even though it's we, we just about got it in this space i couldn't actually add on the bottom murano spikes because otherwise it would touch your head as you walked by and my husband and i are quite tall so we didn't want to, to, to potentially bump into it and knock it down um, but i absolutely love this foyer i think the the fun part about it is this color green which took me about two years to find and i've painted this probably like four or five times <laughs> <laughs> different colors of green um, this is actually called a uh, night vision green and I think it's perfect I think it has the it, a very classic feel but again a, a punch and a pop of color which I think is always really nice when you first walk into a home uh, I think it also really uh, works nicely against the to showcase some of my favorite pieces which are two French oils uh, they're from the turn of the century so around 1900 French oils and we actually got this when we were on honeymoon so my husband and I uh, were married in Tuscany and um, in order for us to get back instead of flying because we had to bring so much so much stuff down to Italy um, we drove back and we just took a nice leisurely drive back and we went through Saint Emilion and of course I have a habit of no matter where we are type in see where I am on Google and then type in antiques to see if there's anything nearby and there was this amazing antique shop just outside of Saint Emilion um, and this little man who had just floor to ceiling antiques and he had these two pieces in the back um, they're oil on wood they're not by the same artist but they would probably have been completed by um, almost like studies academic studies so probably two pupils in the same in the same uh, class but I think they're just fantastic there there's nothing grand about them I don't think that they're they're not pretentious whatsoever they're just studies but I think they're so beautiful and every time I see them I kind of think about our honeymoon and how much fun we had one of my other favorite pieces in the foyer and again I just wanted to put everything that I love really uh, a lot just in one space right um, but is this this a beautiful uh, Italian bus um, it's done after an 18th 19th century um, Italian bus this is probably early 20th century but I think it still is, is quite beautiful um, and the idea is anything that has a skull in uh, from a motif perspective is just talking about brevity of life um, so it's a memento mori is what the, the term is referred to but I just think he's really fun he's usually wearing a Santa hat during Christmas um, he's wearing birthday hats if there's a birthday um, right now he's wearing a fez that I I don't even know where I got this from <laughs> 
but I just thought it was quite fun. And then um, what I always love to use is bring a lot of different color and different stones and layer. Uh, and so these are some, some amber uh, beads that I found when I was in Istanbul. Um, but yeah, I just think he's, he's really fun. Um, another fun piece that I think is really classic and you'll see throughout the home is uh, these chinoiserie uh, blue and white ginger jars. So these are porcelain ginger jars um, that I had commissioned um, when I did a, um, an artist residency in China um, about five or six years ago, if not a bit longer than that. And I fell in love with the, the region of the capital, the porcelain capital of the world. And it's something that, again, you'll see throughout the home because I feel like it's classic, um, but also it's very fun. The artisan and the craftsmanship required is, is second to none. Um, and it's something that Relic has really kind of become known for. It's just my general obsession with bobbin furniture and blue and white ginger jars uh, alongside oil paintings. So um, there we are. I think I've stayed in the UK for so long, mainly because I love the history and the culture of it. So when I was uh, at college, so when I was at Davidson College, I studied art and art history. Um, and before that, when I was in Birmingham, I went to the Alabama School of Fine Arts majoring in art. So to be able to live in a place that had so much rich culture and just had also so many different cultures culminating in London, especially as a hub, really made it hard for me to leave. So I work in finance, but I also founded a business called Relic Interiors. Uh, that's an art and antiques dealing business about three years ago, officially, though I've been collecting for many years before that. Um, the ethos for Relic Interiors is really to make art and antiques transparent and accessible because I really don't think that you should be limited by your budget to live with beautiful things. So the, what's really fantastic about having your own art and antiques business is it means that you can decorate your house and it's constantly changing. Um, and that's really where our home comes into its own because we're able to use uh, the various rooms, the different settings to really kind of showcase the various pieces that I offer on Relic. Um, it's all on Instagram and we have a website, but it's really fun to kind of play around with the decor of the home when I get new pieces in. So now we're in the snug. Um, the snug is a bit of a different concept um, versus the UK versus America. I would say it's most akin to like a den, um, but the idea that it's snug, it's snuggly, literally snug as a bug in a rug, <laughs> that, type of, that type of mentality. Um, and because of that is, I guess, the informal sitting room. Um, and because of that, we really want it to kind of lean into it being a bit darker, a bit moodier. Um, this is the perfect winter room because when it's dark and cold outside, we have the beautiful Ingo Nook fireplace there. My husband loves doing a big fire, a roaring fire. Um, and it's really nice just to have sat here, cozied up, reading a book or watching our favorite uh, program. Um, but yeah, it's probably one of my favorite rooms in the house. Um, again, I was in charge of all of the art, which was really nice. Um, but my husband, this is his claims of fame, he picked out this color, this wall color. So it's called Mission Blue. And um, we knew we wanted to go for a deeper, darker color. We were thinking about a dark green, but that, I knew that I wanted the foyer to be uh, a green, so I thought, I don't want this to look like a hunting lodge. <laughs> so, so we finally settled on the color of blue. And again, it's those, those uh, process of discovery. Um, what I think is really nice is that any of the deeper colors or bold colors really, um, they really have the opportunity to showcase artwork. Um, I am a bit partial to kind of a gold, a gold framed picture. So um, yeah, it works really well. Um, some of my favorite pieces here are, oh gosh, where do I even begin? I love this, this Celine horse head. So this is from the Pantheon. Um, this is a copy, a resin copy. Um, this was actually a limited edition done and commissioned by the British Museum. Um, it's uh, done in mid-century. So again, it has a bit of age, but obviously it's not 
from the Hellenic period, <laughs> but, but it's, I think it's really striking. It's unexpected. I think my husband and I both like when you walk into a room and you just find something that makes you smile or something that's like, oh, I was not expecting that. So um, I've always also loved anything to do with horses. Um, I love horse art, horse portraits. Um, two horse portraits are up here, which are some of my favorites, are by Alexander Pock. Um, he's uh, a, a European a painter um, in the turn of again turn of century, so late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, but he did beautiful equestrian portraits, um, mainly of military um, military styling. Uh, but yeah, I just think those are really nice, and it kind of complements kind of the horse. There's a horse head thing going uh, along here. What I, I find amazing is when we first moved into the house and. We didn't have, we were living in a flat in London, so we didn't have a lot of furniture and certainly not furniture that we wanted to, to bring with us. So we spent the first year or two at auction houses, tons of auction houses around here and just in the countryside where you have these big country homes where people are moving on, people are downsizing, whatever the case may be. And it just means that you can get these beautiful uh, antique pieces for, at the time, uh, you know, pennies on the dollar, which is, or pence on the pound, depending on who you're speaking to. Uh, this is an example of that, this Georgian tall boy. I, every time I see one now, I, I seem to try to buy it because <laughs> I think they're, they're beautiful. Um, I think they're very kind of handsome pieces. Um, and you get them in all different types of conditions as well. But I think all the kind of the nicks and the, the scuffs, it just adds to it. All the patina just really kind of shows its character and shows its age, which I think is quite charming. And obviously the ginger jars, the blue and white, again, they kind of go with pretty much everything. Um, another piece that I really enjoy in here is this Italian Renaissance um, piece here. Um, you probably can't see it. I, it, it's very dark. It needs to be cleaned if I'm completely honest. Um, so I'd have to take it to a restorer to do that. I have an amazing restorer in London. Um, but it's if effectively, uh, you see the uh, central figure on the left, um, and then you see animal studies. And this is again, interpreted in various different ways, but it's a, a sign of enlightenment, a moment of um, being uh, revealed to um, by the heavens or by an angel. Some people is kind of debating on which angel and which scene it's depicting, but I just think it's really nice. And because of its deep tones, it demands you to get very close to inspect it. And I think that's always really nice when you have a piece that just commands the viewer to come a little bit closer and have a share a little bit of a special moment to it. Um, Throughout the house, you'll probably notice that I have for window treatments, there are some curtains, some, <laughs> but the vast majority are tapestries, just because I am obsessed with textiles. I think adding texture into a room um, through various different types of textiles is the easiest way to make a room look lived in, to make a room feel like it's, it's been collected instead of curated as such. Um, and I have a, a few of these Uzbekistan Suzanis, and I think they're just beautiful. Um, this one probably is only about 40 or 50 years old, but they were effectively marriage, su uh, marriage textiles. Um, so, and the term Suzani kind of comes from thread or million threads and the idea that, you know, the marriage will last as long as in, there are threads in, in the tapestry. That's one interpretation of it. But I just think that they're beautifully done and rich in color and they come in various palettes. Um, I particularly like these because they feel a bit more muted, um, but they add a visual interest into a room. Um, and then kind of returning back to the Inglenook fireplace. Again, this is where we normally put the Christmas tree. This is where we spend the most time as a family, uh, me, my husband, my son, and the dogs, uh, and it feels very kind of cozy. Um, and it's nice to be able to have one of my pieces when we're not using the fireplace right now, because it's in the summer. Uh, one of my favorite paintings that um, I've been able to source is a Hendrick, um, Henry Frederick Lucas Lucas um, painting. And it's, I'm obsessed with his work, mainly because he is just, it's second to none regarding equestrian portraits. Um, I think the detailing is really fantastic. This one is actually, I sourced this one for Relic, but I have one that I bought um, at auction that I don't think I could ever part with just because it's, it's really quite special um, to me. Um, but it's nice to have this 
on display here um, when we're not using the fireplace, but obviously when you're using a fireplace, do not put any artwork above it. <laughs> Especially not one like as old as this one because is I'm sure modern fireplaces are a little bit better insulated, but this one is not. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, that's, this is the snug. Uh, I think it just has such wonderful character to it. I really love the exposed beams. I think that's a, a really kind of fun and authentic um, uh, element to the room. Uh, and this is where, again, we spend so much time as a family. Living in a home with a history as long as ours does, it's such a privilege. Um, when my husband and I were looking at moving outside of London and buying our, our first home and buying a house, uh, we knew we wanted a period property. We knew we wanted something that had character and a bit of a soul to it. Um, and we could have never imagined we would find this house. So uh, it's called Chapel House. Um, we jokingly refer to him, the house as Chap. And we say that, you know, we just had such a good energy when we first walked in. And I know that people try to describe that, what that feels that when you know, you know, but we genuinely just said, this is it. Before we even set foot in it, actually, just from the pictures that we saw on the listing, we said this this was it. This was embodied everything that we thought we wanted from a family home. Um, and I think that we always say that Chap is very happy with what we're doing because we're bringing him back to his former glory. So we are now in the dining room. Um, this is probably the room that sees the most attention whenever we have friends over, which is often, uh, just because it's nice to, to have um, a big table spread um, and just have a lot of fun, <laughs> if I'm completely honest. When we first moved out here, it was it took us about five or six years to, to renovate the house slowly, um, but every year we've had a nice Thanksgiving where about 20 of our friends, 18 to 20 of our friends come up and they stay in all of the rooms, uh, sleeping on floors, on sofas, whatever the case, uh, no one's precious here. And we extend this table. My husband actually made this table um, and so it can fit about 20 or 22. There's usually someone kind of sitting in the hallway because it goes so long, uh, but it's such good fun. Um, but I, I absolutely, love this room and I can't remember who said this but they uh, the saying was you know make sure that your dining room um, is really kind of leaves a statement it leaves an impression on someone because you don't you're not in there for very long and if that's so true you'll probably spend you know several hours cooking and then have a meal and it lasts an hour hour and a half or so so make sure that it is memorable um, and so that's the reason why I've included some of my my absolute favorite things. Uh, I keep saying that and I think everything in this house is my favorite thing. <laughs> but um, one being uh, this crystal, French crystal chandelier uh, of a ship. I have been pining for one of these for years. I think um, I think it was actually Kirsten Dunst who said that uh, she had one in her one of her homes and I had never seen anything like it and I just fell in love with it. And one of the beauties of, again, having Relic is that I've had an amazing time meeting so many different other dealers um, who are traveling around the world as, as much as I am, finding and sourcing different pieces. And one of the dealers named Mike, um, he came across this bad boy. And as soon as I saw it, I said, you have to sell that to me. Like, I don't care, just name your price. I have to have this thing. <laughs> Luckily, he was a good, he's, he's a good friend and a fair dealer, so he didn't uh, completely rinse me for it. <laughs> but, but it's one of my favorite pieces. Um, it was, it can, it, it was a light. Um, it can be wired as a light. However, uh, you'll see there's not that much light in this room and that's intentional just because as, uh, however you want to view it, we like eating by candlelight. Um, and it's just, again, a bit of drama that you only use, or you only do when it's, uh, when your friends and family are over. So you might as well. It's normally just us sitting at the kitchen island, uh, if it's just the three of us. So whenever there are friends around, we make the effort and eat by candlelight. So I'm going to change this into a candelabra. Um, and so whenever we have our next dinner party, it will be lit and ready. Um, another really nice thing about um, this room 
is again, my husband built the table and it was our table from London. He's now like really upset because he's like, we need to throw that away, but it has such sentimental value to me. It's just a wooden table, um, you know, all the pieces we get sourced from a local hardware store in London. So it's kind of mix a match of smaller bits of wood. Um, but on the table is the 17th century Verdu tapestry. Um, it's dated late 17th century, early 18th century Verdu tapestry. Um, and it's a Flemish tapestry that has uh, so much history to it. Verdu just basically means it's green. Uh, what you can see is that they normally have a lot of different botanical studies. Um, they have different motifs. This one in particular um, has a bird motif and again foliage, which I think is really nice. It has this kind of, it's, it's worn in places, but it has this type of warmth to it um, that I think is really quite nice. And again, it goes back to my kind of love of textiles and the use of textiles in a room. Um, we don't eat on this, I, I promise. <laughs> so I don't want to have, you know, other art dealers and antique dealers really upset because I'm eating on the tapestry. We don't, I promise we roll, we, we put it away um, uh, safely whenever we're actually eating and just pull out a normal tablecloth. But I think it's a bit of fun and a bit of drama to, to compliment the, the chandelier as well. And this room is just about drama, isn't it? Um, one of the less dramatic, but hopefully um, as lovely pieces is one of my sofas that I designed. So uh, for Relic Interiors, I not only buy and sell um, art and antiques and deal in art and antiques, but I also design um, furniture, indoor and outdoor furniture, that's inspired by a lot of the antique collections, um, pieces I have in my collection. Um, and this is one of the two-seater sofas from um, the Chapel Vale collection. Um, I think what's really nice detailing, if I can brag a little bit, uh, <laughs> is this beautifully made of French oak um, based off of a, a chair, a bobbin armchair at the turn of the century. Um, one of the few claims to fame that uh, America has in regards to uh, antiquities is uh, I, I wanna claim the invention of bobbin. <laughs> so there's a little bit of debate about that, but the idea originally was that bobbin is just um, made up of little bits and pieces of, of wood from a factory. Um, and again, it wasn't considered highbrow at all. And in fact, it was a little bit considered a, a lower class thing. But as it became, as a lot of things do, um, it became in vogue and it made its way to Europe. And so you have French and English bobbin pieces of furniture. I love them because I think it's really kind of fun and whimsical. Um, and I wanted to design a collection based off of that. And um, we came out with Chaffle Bell earlier this year and it's been fantastic in regards to the reception of it. And it's, it's really nice to have something that you've designed in your home, you know, <laughs> in your home that you can enjoy. Um, and so, yeah, this is, this is one of my favorite pieces. It also comes in a three seater sofa, which is very amazing. We have that in one of the upstairs rooms, but um, yeah, just a kind of a pride and joy moment here. Okay, so to continue on with the drama of the dining room, another uh, piece that I really enjoy uh, being in here are uh, two white peacocks. Now these are actually um, stage design sets or part of a stage design and they're done by um, the artists who worked at the old Victoria or the old Vic theater um, for the best part of about 40 or 50 years. Um, they're all hand painted, hand done. And I think, again, they're just so fun and a bit different. It's just a bit odd, uh, like a lot of the things in this room. Um, but I think that it's really quite nice. They're, they're subtle in their palette, um, but they're quite striking um, as objects. And I, I love the kind of the whimsicalness of this juxtaposed the, the hyper-realist drawings um, by one of my absolute favorite contemporary artists. His name is Ramadan Hamas. Um, he is from Tanzania. I originally saw this portrait when my husband and I were at a friend's wedding in South Africa in Cape Town. And I, it was one of those moments where I saw it from across the room and I just beelined straight to it. And I just thought, that has to be a photograph, but I know it's a drawing. It's, and again, sure enough, it's these hyper-realist drawings, and this is actually a self-portrait. And since Ramadan has become a really dear friend of ours, um, you'll see a few of his works throughout the house. Um, 
really it's important to me to have the black image um, throughout our home. Um, I, I collect a lot of different pieces of art and I'm always drawn to figurative pieces. Um, so it's really nice to have the black image uh, juxtaposed to some of the continental European antique paintings that I have. I think it's a really kind of a nice and fun play on design. So I am obsessed with having a really nice tablescape. Um, and so I, wherever I go, I'm constantly collecting different plates and bits of china, um, just because I think it's really fun to have something interesting um, when you're at a dinner party. Um, some of my favorites are, this is um, based off of a, a Spanish Librio, um, but it's a contemporary piece. So Librios are um, these big, beautiful salt glaze um, bowls and plates um, that have these kind of traditional blue and green design, which I think are really fun. That combined with something really fun and contemporary like this Emma Bridgewater uh, piece of ceramic. And again, it, it's just, I think they're really nice and fun and colorful. Um, and then this one is probably one of my favorites as well. It's a, a Turkish design, um, hand painted in Turkey. I think I smuggled this in my carry-on when I was coming back. But yeah. So as far as my personal style and how we decorated the house, um, it's a little bit of everything. I joke to say with Relic, we go from classical to kitsch, and I think that's very much the style of this home. Um, we want it to be true to the, the, the bones of it, and it has so much original charm and history. Um, so we didn't want to go super modern because that's not really our, our taste per se, even though we like modern pieces and we kind of sprinkle them throughout. Um, we really want it to, to lean into that, that characterful, really kind of deep, uh, traditional style um, with pops of culture and pops of color, you know, throughout. Um, so each room, it, it's funny because when my husband and I, before we were married, uh, we talked about what would be our dream home. And he said, oh, in my dream home, every room would have a different theme and every room would have different color. And I remember thinking at the time, like, Ooh, I don't know if that would feel very cohesive or look, <laughs> look very good, but I didn't, I didn't say that because I still wanted to impress him. So I was like, yeah, definitely agree with that. Um, but it's funny because now as we've decorated each room, it has taken, each room has taken on a different style. Um, though I feel like there's a, there's a common thread throughout and I think that's the art that we bought together and then the art that I have for Relic. Um, I think that's really the commonality between it and you'll be able to see that as well. Even if there are different color schemes and different kind of ethos in each room, there's certainly a, a, a common denominator um, that I think is our style, which is classic, traditional with a bit of a twist. So we're now in the drawing room. Um, again, this is probably most akin to a, a formal living room um, or a formal sitting room. Uh, again, I, I think this was before it would have probably been where the women would retire to speak after, uh, after dinner time. <laughs> um, but for us, it's really just a, a room to have a lot of the things that we've traveled and collected, uh, things that we uh, really adore. And we actually use this room a lot, especially after we put Bubba down to sleep. Um, it's nice to just have a little bit of an adult time of just relaxing and maybe having a glass of wine, having probably whiskey for my husband. Um, yeah, and just appreciating the things that we have. Uh, one of my, my favorite things in this room, in the focal point, is uh, the chandelier that we um, I actually bought when I was in Paris, um, wedding dress shopping with one of my best friends, Shannon. The intention of going to Paris was just the wedding dress shop, but of course, I just want to pop into this one little shop uh, as we were walking to lunch. And this, again, this man had the most beautiful uh, shop. It was probably the size of this room, just completely rammed full of uh, different bits and pieces. And I saw this and I asked him, is it working? And he said, yeah, sure. <laughs> Again, thinking like, I'm just going to trust them, sure. Um, and getting this back on the Eurostar to London, uh, I don't think I won too many points with my friend Shannon because I think she was so embarrassed with me having this massive box. Uh, but I think it was really fun. And again, just every time I see it, I kind of think of the, the fun time that we had um, and it was such a nice girl's trip. Um, a, another thing that I love just about living in a period property and, and having... Uh, such an amazing home to decorate is it has 
all these beautiful features that we had nothing to do with. We just moved in. Um, and so, but you get to, to decorate around them. And in this room, it's really this marble fireplace. You could probably have this room completely empty and just have this fireplace and you'd be sorted uh, from a design perspective. But of course, uh, the magpie and hoarder that I am, uh, I, I wanted to cover it with, with all different bits and pieces. But I just think that it has such a nice focal, it adds such a nice focal point to a room. Um, it is a working fireplace as well. Um, and it's, it's one we don't actually use that often because when we want to fire, we go through to the snug um, with the bigger fireplace. But I just think that the detailing is beautiful. And it's one of those things that really makes me um, feel privileged to, to live in a, a house with this history. Um, and certainly this would have been the reception room for the malt master whenever he had guests around. This would have been the room they probably spent the most time in as he was trying to impress them. This is a brass dog um, that's what they refer to as a Hollywood Regency. Um, so this would have been made in uh, the, the 40s or 50s. Um, it's it's amazing. For a long time, I had it on the coffee table because why not? You know, you just want to be unapologetically yourself. And I think all rooms uh, should have a little bit of humor. And I think he's, he's really fun. Um, when I brought him in, though, because I found him in London, from someone who was selling them. He he had had in his family for about 40, 50 years. It was his father's at the time. And he said, you know, we just, we need to make space so we don't need a massive dog <laughs> in our house. And so when I, I took him out of the boot of the car, my dogs start barking because I guess they obviously realize it's a, it's a dog type figure, but I think he's so fun, whimsical. It's one of those fun pieces on Relic that I use quite a lot in the still lifes that I've put together because I think it's, again, unexpected uh, and, and very, and <laughs> a bit gaudy, but a fantastic way. <laughs> um, uh, something that's maybe a slightly more muted, but a, again, a bit more sculptural, is um, what they refer to as a Benin bronze. So um, this is probably it's hidden behind the door here. It's very heavy, so I'm going to try to not break everything as I'm pulling him out. Um, this is, I, I, I often, if I ever come across them, acquire them. Um, this is a Benin bronze. It would have been a replica, probably mid-century replica of a 19th century original um, from the kingdom of Benin, um, which is now parts of Nigeria, effectively. And it's illegal to have the original one. So I, I want to reiterate that it's, <laughs> that it's a replica, a mid-century replica. Um, but I think they're just they're so fantastic. You might have seen one in the dining room when we were in there. Um, I always have them because I think that they're nice sculptural pieces and they're quite tactile. That it makes you want to, to pick them up. Um, and I think next to, say, a classical plaster bust, that co either color and texture and material juxtaposition really looks really nice um, in a room. And again, it's all about visual interest, but it's also about living with things that you love. So, and I love them. So he's here to stay. <laughs> um, and one of the things I, I mentioned before is the, the piece of Henry Frederick Lucas Lucas that I probably would never part with. And I caveat this to say, virtually everything in our house is for sale. <laughs> like, I, I joke when I say that, but I'm also kind of serious because we use our home as a, as a way to showcase the various pieces. But there are a few things that my husband and I will never part with. And this is one of them. Um, it's just a fantastic equestrian portrait by one of my favorite artists. Um, I, again, to be able to capture a horse in its likeness or anything in its likeness, this kind of hyper-realism, I really have an appreciation for. You probably saw that with the Ramadan Hamas uh, hyper-realistic portraits, but uh, it's, I think it's really, really quite an elegant piece. It's very small. The detail is next to none, um, and it requires you to really kind of go as close as you possibly can just to, just to see it. Um, it's titled Mermaid, um, and I got this at auction uh, probably about four or five years ago. Um, and it's, yeah, it's one of my favorite pieces. I move it around the house sometimes just, to, just so I can always make sure that I see it. And we're spending a lot of time here in the drawing room uh, the past few months, so I moved it into here. But it's been in our bedroom, it's been in the landing, it's been in the kitchen. You know, it's, yeah, it's one of my favorite pieces and it's definitely here to stay.
this area in Suffolk had two different types of economies. One was um, brewing, um, so any, anything from like malt making, um, any type of brewers that are nearby, and also in textiles as well. Um, and this house was a malt master's house, so anyone that was in charge of, or the gentleman that was in charge of overseeing the, the organization of getting all of the malt in and um, processing it and then having it shipped out, he would live here. He resided here with his family. And then there's also servants' quarters and servant stairways um, at the back of the house as well. But I think as soon as we walked in, when we saw it for the first time, and the estate agent mentioned that it had ties to Truman Brewery in London, uh, my husband, who's obsessed with craft, craft beer, said, okay, right, where do I sign? You know, he didn't, he didn't actually have to tour the property. He loved that history in itself. Um, and I'm very cognizant of when, even when I'm dealing in antiques, that I am simply a custodian. You know, a lot of the pieces I have in my home um, have been here long before me and they will be here long after me. And I just feel like I just have this privilege right now in this moment to enjoy it. Um, and then hopefully it passes on to a new owner or buyer or customer, whatever the case. And that's really the way I feel with CHAP is that we are simply the custodians and we want to do it it's the best service that we possibly could um, and add a little bit to that history. But, you know, it's been around for 350 years. I'm sure it'll be around for 350 more. So we're now making our way to the kitchen. Um, I think everyone says this, that the kitchen is the heart of the home and it's definitely rings true in this household as well. Um, I was gonna try to pretend like I made all of this, but I certainly did not, <laughs> certainly did not. Um, but we do love to have uh, carbs on the ready whenever you're uh, a little bit peckish. So um, in this room, again, this is the part of the back part of the house. So it's a lot smaller in scale. It has lower ceilings. You'll notice um, as opposed to say the drawing room or the foyer. Um, and it's not a big space at all, um, but it certainly fits the purpose that we have it. Um, we often have the majority of our meals here sat around. And even if it's just with either our parents or our friends that come around, we always just loved having a big spread um, on the, the kitchen island, which is actually something I'm very proud of um, because we made this from an old carpenter's bench. So you might be able to see the old vice and it came from um, the workshop um, of a carpenter. And we loved it so much because again, that kind of antique and old, and this isn't antique, it's probably like early 20th century, but it, it just has a really beautiful kind of aged patina to it. But to make it functional, we knew that we needed to have a white clean surface top <laughs> because all the little holes uh, in the scratch marks in the top of the carpenter's bench is not conducive for cooking. So um, we found an old restaurant that was a seafood restaurant um, and they were closing down and they had two massive stainless steel tables and we effectively cut the legs off of them. I built a subframe underneath the, the tabletop and um, so that we could then attach it to the carpenter's bench. But whenever I want to make it look fancy, I <laughs> put on uh, a nice a nice tablecloth and then just set out a spread. Um, but when it's us, it's usually just the stainless steel version and then we just wipe it clean, especially with a toddler and their little smudgy fingerprints everywhere. It's, it's a lot easier to deal with. On the table, we have a selection of pastries and homemade bread. I will say that I, my friend Liz joked that every time I talked about moving out of London into the countryside, I said, oh, I can make my, I can finally make, have enough space to make my own bread. I can make my own bread. So we have homemade bread here, though I didn't make this bread, though I can make similar types of bread. Um, and then we just have some pastries, which uh, my husband loves. He works from home, so uh, he loves it whenever I set it up like a patisserie or, or something. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really fun. And it, again, this is a, a very kind of cottagey kitchen. Uh, we spend a lot of time in here. You see the dogs are in here constantly. Um, we cook, my husband does the majority of the cooking. Um, so one of this kind of splurge items in the house uh, for doing a lot of the renovation ourselves, it meant that we can really kind of splurge on the items that we really wanted was this um, eight eye Laconche uh, cooker range and it's, it has a double oven and it cooks a 20 pound turkey in about two hours so it is a well worth it <laughs> and when you have 20 hungry guests for thanksgiving <laughs> who want a turkey in two hours we got we have it sorted 
Um, but one of my favorite things in the house, uh, let alone the kitchen, is this this tea towel. And this is from um, this says London, and it's just of one of the one of the guards. But it's from my grandma, so we call her Mama. And this was in her kitchen for years and years. So my mom's mom. And it's so funny that it's almost like she knew that one day I would move here, or one day one of us would move here. But it's just really nice to have around um, and as a reminder of my roots in Alabama and of my mama because she was a formidable woman and hopefully I can be half as amazing as she was so um, but yeah we just we love to have some of our just incredible things here um, but it's so it's so practical like even this tablecloth this is uh, amazing we got this in, in Rhodes um, in Greece and but it, and it and it looks super delicate but you can throw it in the wash washing machine and air, air dry it you know it's one of those things that we live in a house that is lived in <laughs> you, you know it might look curated now it does not normally look like this uh, we have like a, a love again my American roots having these um like American quilts, these antique quilts, and what these are normally is, is kind of nicely draped now, but what this normally does is just cover this up because we have the dogs up here. You know, we have Bubba up here with his crayons and things. And, you know, we just, we want to make our home feel warm and inviting. And I would hate to have friends come around and they feel like they couldn't relax. And that's one thing that we both love to do is relax and have friends around, so. <music> Now I wanted to show you guys our downstairs um, powder room. Um, someone once told me that it's probably the room that guests, if they're only staying a, a short amount of time, will leave the most impact. So you should make it something memorable, memorable rather. Um, and so that's what we did here. And we refer to it as a little jewel box, but effectively I just wanted to make it feel like you're in a Turkish hammam. Uh, and that was kind of led by um, having this this sink that you would normally have uh, at a hammam, uh, which is basically like a Turkish spa, effectively. So we, I was able to find um, a marble dealer um, in Turkey, and we told them what type of marble we were looking for, the dimensions, and they were able to to hand carve it uh, to the dimensions that we required. Because again, this is a very small room, but we want it to have a lot of impact. Um, and then we found these um, tiles. Again, it, it feels quite modern in the fact that the, the way they're laid out, but it, it also feels uh, a bit rustic in the way they're done, that every one has a different finish and a different glazing on it. Um, and that's from Mandarin Stone. And Mandarin Stone was also able to give us that uh, Violet, Carrera, Violet Carrera marble. Whew, that's a mouthful. <laughs> um, so it was the deep veining um, of the marble, which I think is really nice. And again, a sh shower room when we do have 10, 12 of our friends staying over, it's nice to just have an extra, an extra shower um, in the house so that you don't run out of hot water too quickly. Um, but that's it. Okay, so now we're gonna go upstairs to see some of the bedrooms and the nursery. I mentioned before that some of my favorite pieces of art um, really kind of include the black image. And sometimes it's very hard to find uh, pieces, antique paintings, oil paintings um, with the black image. Um, but this was absolutely one of my favorite paintings in the house. I think it takes pride of place. Um, it's an 1856 um, copy of a piece that was done in the 1820s, I believe, um, called The Young Courtesan. Um, or it's sometimes referred to as the allegory and infidelity. And you have the central female figure um, here that's looking out to the viewer as potentially the next, her next lover, um, where there's, and she's surrounded by three figures that are obviously all eyes on her and giving her different treats and treasures to win her heart, but she's obviously on to the next. Um, I just think that it's, it's really quite beautiful, the depiction of the black figure um, to her, on the right side of her um, or on her left as we as she looks at it um, but I just think that it's a, a fantastic piece um, and it, again it was originally painted by Alexandre Francois um, but yeah it's, it's one of those things that I love that 
image and then behind me you'll see another Ramadan Hamas's um, piece that I actually gave that to my husband for our first anniversary uh, because it was paper is the anniversary gift and um, I, because I had become good friends with Ramadan I commissioned him to do this piece and it's called Shushu um, which means uh, grandmother or, or old old mother um, and I think it's just beautiful and so many people as they come up onto the landing they think that it's a photograph um, and then you get very close you can see that it's a drawing and I think it's just it's magnificent, honestly, and it's, it's such a delight to see every day. Um, now we'll make our way to a, one of the guest bedrooms called uh, the map room. And we titled it that or named it that because we wanted to, again, have a lot of the pieces that we source from around the world um, in one room. And it feels like an explorer's room as such. That was the original intention. Now it's just turned into... <laughs> Like, it feels like a, a like your grandmother's sewing box because I keep, when my husband's not looking, I keep putting more color and more frill in it everywhere. Um, but what I love in this room, um, very selfishly, <laughs> is uh, my three-seater bobbin sofa. Um, so this, is, again, is from the Chapel Bell collection. And I think it's really nice. It's done in a, a dust rose velvet. And it's just super comfortable. One of my friends... Claire and um, her kids came up for a weekend and her little girl Lily just was in love with the sofa and we would catch her just asleep or curled up in the corner of it and it just I don't know just made my heart sing because that's exactly what we want we want well-made comfortable furniture built for a last lifetime <laughs> so um, but yeah we were able to just have a little bit of everything in this room. This is a, a, an original bobbin piece. Um, this is early 20th century. Um, and again, this is kind of the motif that was in, that inspired the, the new Chapel Bell collection. I mean, you'll probably find a billion examples of bobbin throughout my house. <laughs> I, we jokingly say it's an obsession, but it's, it's true. I, I think it is. Um, but this is, yeah, this is the map room. And this actually, this quilt, Again, talking about textiles, um, I actually um, received that from a friend that I met on Instagram. So on Relic, um, which is where I sell the antique artwork and the bobbin furniture um, and also textiles, I've been able to meet a load of different amazing dealers, but even more amazing are friends on there, so customers, people who want to collaborate, people who also share this uh, love of interiors. And one of them, uh, a lovely, um, one of my lovely followers sent me this because I, I kept complaining I could not find enough quilts. <laughs> but now I have too many, so I feel like I should pay, repay her the favor. Um, but yeah, it, Relic has been wonderful for that. One of the, my favorite design tricks or maybe it's not even a trick just one of my favorite design techniques is layering rugs layering different colored rugs textured rugs style of rugs um, I actually saw this originally um, when I was um, in South Africa and we were staying at this beautiful Airbnb and it was just a mismatch of 15 different rugs in their sitting room and we my husband and I both said like this is just so fun and it's so nice and so it was a, certainly a conscious effort when we had the time and space to finally uh, to layer the various different rugs. And again, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about, this kind of this idea of textiles and adding texture and color. Um, and it means that you don't have to be too serious about your interiors. You can just put together what you like. And if it's all coming from you, from your own aesthetic, it will all pull together. So this rug is one um, that I got when I was in Morocco with a, a good friend named Tia. And it was so funny because you should have seen us going through the airport with like 17 bags, each just full of Berber rugs, you know, um, and rugs from the Atlas Mountains. This is a contemporary rug here um, that's supposed to look antiqued and worn and things and then this is an afghan rug um so and this is a, again just a wool afghan rug and i think all together they're just so nice um that next to the quilt you know next to the suzani <laughs> next to the french pelmet you know it's just all of it all of it together i think just really kind of pulls together to make a really beautiful piece and that's what I love to offer on, at Relic or through Relic Interiors. And in fact, I commissioned um, this ICAT 
a tablecloth, this round tablecloth um, to have made because I like the idea of just adding a splash of color in a, a guest bedroom um, that you can just kind of change very easily, but it's just, it's just fun and it just kind of shows that it has a, like a nice texture to it. Um, but yes, I, I love layering. I think it's a really kind of fun and easy way to bring a new life to a room without changing your furniture, a massive financial outlay. So now we're in Hendrix's room or the nursery. Um, though I say it's a nursery, um, we were just saying that it actually is a room that he can really grow into. Um, it, the initial thought around this room is surrounded by the color of the wall. Uh, it's called a pate color, but I really wanted this kind of terracotta color to be the base, the foundation of the room, namely because I really wanted to use this color somewhere in the house. <laughs> so, and it didn't feel too feminine, didn't feel too masculine. Um, so it was a perfect palette uh, to, to then create this room around. Um, and the theme of it is really just started out as safari themed based off the paintings that are behind you. But um, what I really love in this room is uh, the, the collection of antique samplers here. So uh, what samplers used to be before there were phones and the computers and, and things, uh, little girls would practice their alphabets or practice their sewing skills on what they would refer to as samplers. And these are the sewn things. So they would normally just have the ABCs or maybe a Bible verse um, or, or something of that. But what I think is really quite charming about them is that they'll have the, the date in which they're, they're made, the name of the person who made it, and then the age. So this one is from 1882 uh, at age nine, and her name was uh, Sarah Miles. Uh, it's, it's, things like that is quite sweet. And occasionally, which I think is really endearing, is that you will find a little bit of a spelling mistake, and it's because it's done by a child. Um, but I just think that was quite nice to have Hendrix grow up around something like that. Um, and then also he's practicing the ABCs, which, <laughs> which is never a bad thing. Um, my obsession with Bobbin continues with the, with the crib, but I think the, the kind of most exciting thing about this room and really the kind of the thing that spurred the design of it was this collection of 19th century um, paintings of safari animals. So. Uh, I have an amazing dealer, um, his name is Richard, who deals in all types of art, uh, and he's absolutely fantastic. He's the loveliest person in the world. And he was able to find these from a, a, a private estate. And when I saw them, I fell in love with them. And he said, I don't want to split them up. I, want to, I don't want to sell them individually. I want to sell them as a set. And when I saw them, this is years before I had Bubba, I just thought, oh my gosh, those would look, those would look perfect in a nursery. But I don't want to jinx it, so I, I, I bought them with the intention of selling them on, uh, but secretly hoping, I think I put them in a price point that it was too high that anyone would actually buy them, <laughs> so they wouldn't actually sell. So and as soon as we found out that we were expecting Bubba, I immediately took them off from sell and, and knew that they were going to have uh, the pride of place in, in his room. Um, so it's, it's funny because I'm sure we could simply Google what this animal is, but my husband and I just like to pretend, like make up different names for it, and, and Hendrix is starting to make up different names for it as well. Um, but yeah, I just think this is a, a, such a nice room. We want it to have a big couch because if you've been there with newborn days, you know you won't be getting a lot of sleep, and so um, we've spent a many a nights sleeping here while he's trying to trying to get some rest. But um, this is this is probably my favorite room because it's the room that my little boy went from a little baby to this rambunctious, willful toddler. So um, yeah, it really share, it holds a special part place in my heart. Home to me means a place where you can genuinely be your authentic self. I, I don't care how cliche that sounds, but I, I often speak to people and they, when we talk about decor or styling or what to do with their interiors, and they say, oh, I've, I've seen this trend, I really like that. I, I see that trend, I really like that. And that's fantastic, but surely you want your home to be where a place that really kind of embodies everything that you believe in, everything you love and cherish. You know, you shouldn't follow some hashtag or some trend because it seems popular right now. Um, I, we always say we, we have the absolute luxury of being able to travel around the world, visiting family and friends and seeing new places and 
doing new things, but we always say as soon as we come home, there's, there's just kind of this, this warmth that we really just can't wait to get back to. Um, and I think that if you can create that, you know, I think you really kind of won the lottery. Hi Homeworthy, I'm Fiona. Welcome to my home in London. Come on in, I can't wait to show you around. Alison Kenworthy, the founder of Homeworthy, and we're now offering a membership plan that gives our supporters early and exclusive access to new videos. Hi, Homeworthy. I'm Roz. You're here at my home in Los Angeles? Come on in, I can't wait to show you around. With this membership, we invite you to open more doors, discovering new homes, rooms, and personalities available only to those with the keys to our guest house. You'll be part of a community of people who are just as passionate as you are about interior design. Before today's episode, click the join button below to support all of the storytelling we do on this channel. Our growing community of members help to directly fund more videos so we can capture these extraordinary homes from around the world. So join today to receive early and exclusive access to new Homeworthy videos. You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Hello, my name is Fiona Delees. I'm a colour consultant and I'm based in London. We're here in my home and I'm here to tell you what I love about my home, what I love about colour and what I love about my work. My home is a Georgian cottage. It was built around 1750. It's a mostly timber framed structure. So it's a very quirky building with lime walls. It moves, it breathes. It has a lot of atmosphere. The light moves in very mysterious ways, which is one of the reasons why I absolutely love it. So when I first viewed the property, I literally had to wade through brambles to get to the front door. The building had been unlived in for about seven years. And when I walked in, I knew instantly this was the house for me. It was calm, quiet. You could really feel the love in here. The previous owners, hadn't renovated it since the 1970s, so it pretty much was a gut job. There wasn't even any central heating here. The bathroom was downstairs. There was a Jack and Jill bedroom upstairs, which I wanted to change. So it really was a project about bringing the house back to life. And I had gone through some big life changes prior to that. So it felt very much a symbiotic process in restoring myself, healing myself, restoring the house, healing the house, literally. It has lime walls, and what I learned for the first time is that the house needs to breathe. So I went about using lime paints to protect the walls and to find the colors that really worked for my personal story, my narrative, my heritage. Um, the process was really difficult because it meant bringing up floors, moving walls around. It's a listed building, so I had to get consent, which was incredibly difficult, working with the local council at times. But it was really worth it in the end for me. So we're in my living room. I don't have a formal entrance. The Georgian cottages sometimes didn't, so you would have a front door that walks straight into the living room. It's a double-fronted cottage with windows on either side. So I've had to make the space cosy as an entrance, but also practical and functional as the main living room area. So I'd love to show you around at some of my favorite pieces. One of my prized possessions is my collection of woodland scenes. And these are things that I've just picked up on my travels. Every single picture here is a painting, it varies in age, some are antique, some are mid-century. And what's really important for me about this whole wall here is that I feel I'm submerged in a woodland. It's a real connection to where I grew up in Hampstead by Hampstead Heath. 
and just to come in and see the trees against this fantastic green wall just lifts my spirits. I have the woods on my doorstep too, so there is a narrative here, not only with my past, but also with where I happen to live. So this is one of my favorite features, my woodland scene. So this armoire here is, um, I was told it was Bavarian, but I have a feeling it might be Italian. It was bought from a thrift store and it has the most beautiful carvings of basically an urn with what I think are acanthus leaves coming out, some scrolls, and then on either side, different features, which is what I particularly love. So I like playing on symmetry, but I also like there to be a difference in the symmetry. So here we have the fruit with the pears and the grapes and possibly a pomegranate, whereas here we've got something that might represent vegetables like a split pod of peas and you can just see the peas coming out. It's a really beautiful piece. I understand that it was adapted by um, somebody in the 1950s on the inside who was a tobacconist and he had put shelves inside originally so he could dry his tobacco leaves. It's a very special piece and because I don't have an entrance hallway I've adapted it so that it houses all my shoes, coats, scarves, hats, gloves, bags. So when you come in you don't see any of that at all. It's just neatly hidden in here with a few hats across the top. The pots are really special to me. These are antique salting pots. So originally they would have been filled with salt and meat would have been put in there to preserve them. I absolutely adore the glazed patina on them and salting pots would sometimes be tilted for ease of access so they, they roll about quite nicely and I think they make a really lovely feature into the living room. They kind of remind me of that whole concept of from plant to plate, something that's really important to me. The pot that has gained a bit of popularity is actually this very special confit pot over here which I call the Toscana pot. I got it on a sourcing trip to Italy in Tuscany and it has the most beautiful patina. The image of the pot was featured here in Homes and Gardens magazine, which won Colour of the Month award with Edward Bulmer Natural Paint. So this pot has been used on quite a few styling shoots and it's my lucky pot, I call it. It's very different from your average confit pot, which tends to be more yellow and plain, such as this one here, which is a lovely big one here, as you can see. This is a particularly special one because it has holes in the bottom so it would have been used for drainage. So that one over there has a paint patina on it that I've never seen anywhere before. Another two of my favourite pots in my room are the antique Polynesian water vessels which have three spouts. They're handmade and they have the most beautiful hand patterns around them. I've never seen anything like them before. They're very rare and they're very precious to me. All my pots are precious to me because I relate pots very much to the human condition, us being vessels, carrying what's important to us in our lives. And pots originally would have held commodities that were important to us too, such as water, wines and oils. And speaking on that, I can't wait to show you my very special walnut jug collection in the kitchen later on. This fantastic sofa I picked up in an auction for £50 and I absolutely love it. I've thrown a whole load of scatter cushions on it. It's so comfortable to relax on. It's actually long enough to sleep on, not that I ever have, but it is long enough as a single bed. Um, it's a great piece to relax on in the sun, reading a book, especially in the winter, when you just get that heat falling onto your body. It's one of my favorite places to sit so I can just look outside. And I also love the random combination of cushions as well. Just mixing up the colors in a very natural and organic way. I love decorating with nature and I usually use real live flowers or dried flowers such as this arrangement here. Um, particularly having been a florist for a long time, I love to forage with what I can find in the garden or the outside. But these particular branches here are artificial 
and I put them up usually for Christmas and they end up staying up for a lot longer because I just think they're really sweet and cute um, and they remind me of the roses outside in the garden that have the little red buds that are starting to come up. So I sometimes leave them up there. I'm very inspired by natural elements in the house so I try to bring them in wherever I can and being a Georgian cottage with quite low ceilings light can be a challenge for growing plants so I like to add these little touches of nature wherever I can. This is the original fireplace here it's really deep and I was looking for a cast iron grate and I couldn't find one I quite liked and I actually found this uh, chucked outside somebody's house down the road one evening when I was out jogging so I brought it back home. It was incredibly heavy, but what I really, really, really love about it is actually got um, the emblem of the Fleur de Lise, which is quite a sweet, quirky little ode to my surname, de Lise. So at the back there are three Fleur de Lise signs. I also love to throw lavender on it when I've got a live fire. I grow lavender in the garden and so does my neighbour especially with the south facing sun here. So when I've got the fire on, I love to scatter lots of lavender on there. It sparks, it smells, and I have a little pot of it here and I just literally throw it on with the little shovel here. And it just makes a really cozy winter evenings fire. These two chairs here are part of the same set with the sofa. Um, it was basically the deal. I, I couldn't take just the sofa, I had to take the chairs as well. And as it happens, they worked out really well. One of them is literally collapsed underneath, but um, that becomes the dog chair with a blanket on it whenever anybody visits with a dog. So that's the allocated dog throne, whereas guests get to use the hair-free one. I actually often hear from people this concern about mixing red and green. Uh, and it perhaps making a room feel a bit Christmassy. Um, for me, I actually don't think that red and green together looks anything like Christmas, funnily enough. And the reason for that is because if you actually look at nature outside, you will see that there are a lot of natural combinations in the garden that involve different shades of pink to dark pink and into red and green. So the trick to it not being too Christmassy would be to use muted colours. So if you have a look, for example, the, the reds here, they're quite antiqued, dull colours. And I think sometimes if you use a material where you've got a texture and a pattern and you get these two tones here, so you've got the deeper reds with perhaps the lighter colours coming through, that breaks it up a little bit. So don't be afraid. I would encourage people not to be afraid of mixing red and green together. It's a beautiful combination, but I would also layer it with perhaps other colours like the chartreuse greens, maybe some soft dusky pinks and apricots and maybe some dusky oranges. Then you really do diffuse that whole idea of it being anything too Christmassy. The other thing that I really love about this room is I have a bit of a gripe with radiators, especially if they're not antique old ones. And when, bearing in mind that this house didn't have any heating, I had some very good radiators put in, but I don't like looking at them and I don't particularly like painting them. So I like to mask them. And what I have done here is I've taken a beautiful half screen that I found in an antique shop and I've placed it across the radiator. So it almost acts as a little background. Again, going back to that whole idea of layering, coming from my um, set design days. So I'm layering behind the chairs to, to give a background, a pretty background, but actually there's a very practical reason there for me. I'm hiding the view of the radiator as well. What I learnt in moving to this very special property is the importance of understanding the atmosphere of a house. And by that I mean, we bring our own en energy into a house, but ultimately, particularly old buildings, they very much have their own character and personality and you need to settle with the space. You need to learn to read the light. You need to understand how the light moves through the rooms in order to think about how you want to live in those spaces, how those spaces make you feel. And this was really part of this um, restorative process was about understanding how do I want to feel in this space? How do I want it to um, make me function on a daily basis? 
And how do I want to bring my narrative into it through colour, through natural light movement and through decor? So these are the sort of important elements that I bring to my work um, as a colour consultant. This house has really helped me understand the importance of narrative, story, light. Um, and on, on the subject of light, my mother was a Tai Chi teacher and I grew up with quite a lot of Japanese um, influence in my life, very Taoist influence, which was a really interesting combination because she was Italian, but also I lived in an arts and crafts cottage. So all these extraordinary elements of understanding light, pattern, um, they were very much part of my heritage in how I understood um, design, texture, gardens, and how all of these elements can link together in creating spaces that are very, very personal uh, to somebody. So the next room in the house is the dining area and in order to transition really nicely into that space with the colours, given that I'm using a pink against a green, I've used a very subtle pink blanket on the edge of the sofa just to help the eye transition into the changing colour from this space into the next. So come with me and take a look at the dining room. Okay, so here we are inside the dining room. It's a small but really warm, cosy space, which I've painted in a lovely shade of pink on the top with a slightly warmer color on the paneling. These colors make me think of Italy, think of the Riviera, the beautiful colors of the buildings there. I'm totally transported in this space. Um, the two key features of this room really are the table, which has beautiful claw and ball foot, and the sideboard here, the drawers. Um, both are my grandfather's from Italy, so they, these are very special pieces for me. I really love the painting on here, the colours, the delicate flowers. It's such a quirky, beautiful piece, and I use this to house my table linen, um, stationery, all the practical things that I might need. And then on top, I have the Casa Pupa lamps, which I got from um, a client when I had my previous flower shop. She was getting rid of them. She hated anything from the 1950s and wanted everything modern. So I snapped these up because these are an absolute steal. They are pomegranates and they're just simply beautiful. The shades I found in a thrift store, so I changed the original shades, which were orange, to this lovely rich red. And for me, it really, really works. And then scattered on the top are a collection of these beautiful gemstones, um, which I just think are really pretty. And I love layering with natural elements. So it doesn't have to be just botanicals, it can be minerals as well. And I think the treat on the top really is the ostrich egg. Um, which again I found in a, another thrift store and I absolutely love this. Um, it's such a beautiful piece. So it sits here quite proudly as the only egg in the room. The dining table, um, I, have, I have memories of using this in Italy. The chairs I found from a friend who's a mid-century dealer. I think they work really well. Um, again, I love this soft muted red which goes back to what I was saying before about if you're using red try to go for colours sometimes that are a little bit aged and antiqued like this colour here and for winter I always throw a really nice comfortable sheepskin rug so when my guests or when I'm sitting down here at the table and I've got the log fire on particularly I just feel really really cosy. These two chinoiserie panels are really extraordinary and I'm yet to finish them off. I haven't quite decided how I'm going to do that. These are silk. It's black silk and they've been hand painted with this beautiful scene of birds of paradise and flowers and greenery. They're just so delicate, but I particularly like the fact that they're on a black background. So I have two of them here and I think what I might do at a future, future stage is put them inside a beautiful frame and have them glass mounted so I can put them up on the wall. And the other reason I like them in here is because they balance the black that comes from the antique Indian desk over here. 
This is a really special piece. It's probably about 200 years old and it has very useful storage. But what's particularly interesting, a friend of mine who's a gardener said that he thinks that it actually has cardamom leaves painted on it. So these could potentially be cardamom heads with little cardamom leaves. And I love the fact that this particular part of the desk is less worn than the rest of it. And that's because it usually sits up like this. On either side of the desk, I have these huge tall grasses, which I once used on a styling job. Um, the theme was something quite magical and mystical and we were approaching winter. So I used a lot of these scattered around and I just, I just love the colour of them. I love the muted tones and how feathery and magical they look. I couldn't bear to get rid of them so I've propped them on either side and they just about fit in with my low ceilings. And they beautifully frame a very special painting of a bird's nest here with the egg and I have here an actual nest that I found that had fallen out of a tree. These are all mementos of early childhood memories to me, which have naturally come my way um, when I've been on sourcing trips. So this is quite a special little corner for me in a very different way to perhaps the other features of the room. Because I have the woodlands on my doorstep, often when I go out in the mornings or in the evenings, I can hear the woodpeckers. And here I have a vase, which I think is probably about 1940s, 1950s. I found this vase, which has the woodpecker on the edge of what is pretending to be a trunk. And these are ferns that I've picked from the local woodland and I've just left them to dry. So again, not only is it something that I think is really pretty to look at, but it's just reminding me of those moments when I go out for walks in the woodlands and the beauty of nature that I see. Over here in this cabinet, I have a collection of wooden block prints and they're all quite different. So at some point, I'm really looking forward to the idea of getting them out, playing with my paint colours and maybe doing some block print work on silk or canvas or linen. Um, I'm quite fond of those over there. And over here I have on this little shelf here, a lovely collection of books that are to do with nature. So I've got geology, I've got birds of the British Isles, I've got stories called on the nature trail, um, woodland trees. These are all books that I've just found when I've been out and about. And I really like the way they play on those muted greens and reds and apricot colours. This is just my little nature corner over here. The style of my home is very eclectic. And this is because I don't adhere to any trend. I never have. I think it's really important to acquire things through time that speak to you on a personal level. And then eventually you can amalgamate all these things to actually create the style that's important to you. I've decorated my home definitely in a very colorful way, but what I really like about the colors I work with is that they can be quite deep and strong, but also quite muted and aged. So in a way, I really like to work with antiqued colors. So greens and reds and perhaps purples and browns that look like they've been aged with time. Some of the items I've inherited are from my Italian grandfather in Italy, which are very much statement items in the home. And the rest of the items are things that I've just acquired through my styling career, through my travels, things that I've looked at and thought, that's got a really interesting story and I want that to become part of mine. So I very, very rarely actually go to a shop to buy something new. Everything, pretty much everything I have has either come from um, thrift markets, antique markets, auction houses, just things that I've not expected to find and that life has just tossed my way a bit like opening a Pandora's box and just suddenly seeing something you think, I've got to have that. Going across the middle of this room is this original beam 
um, supporting the upstairs part of the house. And I wanted to make it a feature. So I painted it black, so it worked with my black panels. And I did something different for a change. I used a gloss so you could really see it. And then going across the top of it, I hung some hops. So if anybody hasn't ever used hops before, I really encourage you to use them. When they first arrived, they were still a little bit green and fresh because when you order hops, usually they come quite fresh because that's when they're at their most supple and they can bend. The smell was absolutely intoxicating. It was just deliriously delicious. And I put them up and you just leave them because then they dry and they crisp. And they've become quite a feature of the room now. So this is basically a hops ceiling. On one side here, I took the wallpaper down because I wanted to put a lime wash effect on the ceiling and I wanted it to breathe, whereas on the other side it had been papered when I first renovated. So I've taken the paper down here as part of a second stage of restoring the building, um, which I've started to do by changing one wall here with the colour going from a lime wash effect of a colour that I mixed myself using paints that I've got left over. So I get this slightly mottled effect on the walls, which I really, really love here. And then I mixed a slightly darker colour to set this off, as opposed to the flat colour, which we've got on one side here. So this is my corner of experimenting with mixing colours, mixing my own paints, and going for an effect on lime wash wall. The story with some of the African artifacts I've got around the house um, is a story that links me to my father actually, who spent a, quite a lot of time living in Santa Fe and Albuquerque when I was a child. And I have collected some beautiful Cuba cloths, which I have upstairs. And to complement the theme in another part of the house, I've collected a few of these African masks. I don't actually know the age of them, but what I do know is that they are perhaps some of the more beautiful ones that I've seen. And so I've placed them on either side here. And my father was always interested in different cultures. And I remember that he used to collect things from South America and African drums or um, African musical instruments. So over here, I just have this little ode to him really. I would consider that my style is a little bit maximalist, but also in a way where I like there to be calm within it. So the maximalist element of my style very much comes from building layers, and I really enjoy building layers in 3D. So I like building them in depth or in height. Um, but within those layers, I like there to be some kind of calm scattered about. So the, ma the maximalist part of me doesn't necessarily apply to having a room completely overwhelmed with lots of visual distraction. So there's sometimes a joke with the back room being a bistro because in the evening, particularly when I've got the log fire on and I've got all the side lighting on, um, I tend to light all the candles. This old house I'm not too precious about candle wax. I love candles on everywhere. So there will be candle wax on the floor, on the surfaces. I'm not too precious about it because really it is the, the memory of the evening. So I tend to collect candle sticks, different ones, uh, wood, metal. You can see from the condition of the wax on them, how well they get used. So this room is really is very, very cosy, it's very snug, and when guests come, they, they feel like they're in a slightly different world as well. You go back in time, and it's definitely an experience. My professional journey to becoming a colour consultant is quite a long and varied one. Colour consultancy didn't really exist as a profession about 20, 25 years ago. But I realised over a course of time that by default, I had been operating with colour through a number of dif different disciplines. So I originally trained in set design. 
and set design was something very fundamental to the way I understood to read the world. As a child I went to the ballet a lot, to the theatre a lot, so I was used to seeing lots of layers. Also I was very involved in gardening. Um, I grew up with a very huge kitchen garden that I was very much involved in. So I learned to read space through layers. That journey took me into floristry where I then had three separate uh, floristry shops and again working with colour combinations even more except this time flowers being used for events but any kind of event so I be began to understand that colour was relative to emotion and purpose and through those businesses I then started doing styling for people's homes as well um, I worked a little bit with mid-century design as well as selling and collecting antiques to sell and eventually when I had a little antique uh, emporium in Hampstead I started to consider maybe I want to start using some paints in my shops and that was really the starting point for stepping out of my little antiques business and floristry business into the world of colour. My mantra to colour is read the light of a room. I think it's totally fine if you are somebody who loves bright vivid colours or if you're somebody who likes really calm soft whites. I work with people who love all different types of colours for their home but the one thing that I always bring to my consultancy services and that I encourage people to think about at home is read the light because the way you understand light in your home can really help you understand how you want the nuances or the hues to change so that you can create either that really bold combination you want or that very soft subtle one which has a relationship with the light in a room so my mantra is read the light of the room so the room adjoining the dining room is the kitchen, which was formerly the bathroom when I first took the property on. It was a space that had two little hallways off of it as well, which was crazy. It was really, really small. So in order to flip the bathroom to the upstairs, this is the space that I decided to dedicate for the kitchen. So come through, I'd love to show you more. This is one of the smallest rooms in the house, but it is perhaps one of the most intense in terms of what happens here. Because of my Italian heritage and being involved with a kitchen garden, this space I deliberately chose to be very, very calm in terms of colour. So I mixed a colour myself and painted it on the walls, which is a very warm coppery brown. It picks up on the hues of the old copper pots that I have tucked away in the wall over there. And to pull in my Italian aesthetic, I'm using white, very plain white tiles here, which is what my grandmother had in her kitchen in Italy a long, long time ago. There wasn't the, uh, the privilege of having lots of tiles to choose from. People just used very simple white tiles, but I really like the simplicity of them. But the piece that really sings in here is the massive credenza, which is my grandfather's. I brought this back from Italy and I'll never forget the day when it arrived. The guys turned up with, with the truck, with all the furniture, and they said, it's not gonna go, it's not going to go. It came in two pieces and I said, it is going to go because it simply had to. There was just not the negotiation of it not moving in. And it just so happens that because like all the walls and ceilings in the house, which are wonky, this particular corner here, you can't even fit a piece of paper in. The credenza literally was made for the kitchen. And this is where I house all my plates, my glasses, my dry products, my pots and pans, my cutlery. One of the things I like the most about it is that it's the perfect work top height for me because I'm quite tall. So I like my work top higher than the average work top height. And it's a brilliant surface for me to just show off my very prized collection of walnut jug pots, which are very, very old, very, very special. And they just sit here and make the place look interesting without being over cluttered. It's the biggest piece in the kitchen and 
it meant that I didn't have to go for the formality of a fitted kitchen, which I just don't like. I wanted something that was quite rustic and very simple. So I've paired the credenza with a freestanding cooker and a trolley which houses all the bits I need for cooking and then a beautiful Italian marble worktop and a screen of material which basically hides the washing machine, the dishwasher and the tumble dryer. So I have an antique um, hail bay fork which I use as a hanger for my various aprons and I saw it once on a styling shoot and I just thought it was a really clever idea. So in order to hide it I just hang it over the door and I use it as a brilliant storage place to hang um, a linen a linen apron and a couple of really old leather ones. You can also actually use it to slot your glasses in. So if you were to tilt it against a wall like that, you can turn your glasses, wine glasses upside down and you could actually use it um, as a quirky glass storage system for a kitchen. So one of the reasons I wanted the kitchen to remain quite calm with its colours, very natural and rustic, the colours of the pots such as um, the three I've got over here, for example, is because I really wanted the emphasis to come from flavour and aroma. And I actually love cooking some of the simplest dishes, the ones that require not too much fuss, but cooked right, they taste the best to me. So I love cooking polenta and I love cooking a really beautiful tomato sauce or perhaps a ragu. I've always got shallots, onions and tomatoes in the kitchen because they are my staple. So long as I've got those I can pretty much have, um, I pretty much know I've got anything I can make to cook. So my staple, my favourite food to cook, particularly when I want a little bit of comforting, is probably a really simple pasta dish drizzled with beautiful aromatic olive oil, maybe a little bit of dried thyme, this is from Sardinia, um, some garlic, and some shallots and onions, just slow cooked, beautiful, really delicious. It's so difficult for me to think if I have a favourite colour because I love so many, but I definitely have a tendency towards greens. Everything is on the table for me when it comes to colour because colour teaches me to read the world in different ways that I might not have before. I used to have a real issue with white. I used to find it incredibly dull, incredibly boring, and it never really quite delivered for me. But I've learnt more recently that the different hues and nuances in white can really elevate a space in a way that I never anticipated before. So there isn't really a colour that I can say I won't touch. I actually love them all. So there's a lot more going on upstairs and I would love to show you what I've done. So come and join me. So I'm at the top of the stairs and the two features which I really love about the stairwell, which is very small, is that I have the original lime walls here, which have beautiful shades of murky, muddy yellows. So I didn't want to paint those, I've left those and they are a great backdrop for this collection of bird prints and some butterflies that I've picked up on other travels um, in various antique shops. And to finish them off, I've put them inside this huge gold gilt frame that I picked up from a friend. Um, it just seemed a huge wall and a great space to put a massive frame in what is otherwise a really narrow stairwell and then to fill the big frame with lots of little frames. So I thought that was quite a clever, quirky trick. And then at the top of the stairs, I am straight into my dressing area, which used to be a room, a small bedroom. Um, but in order to get my grandfather's huge wardrobe in, which is the wardrobe to the chest of drawers downstairs, um, I actually had to move away some of the panelling that was the rim divider in order to get this in. So I absolutely love this piece. Um, it's got the, the painting on it and the colours are just absolutely brilliant. And this space is south facing, so it gets a lot of sun in here. It's a great space just to get ready. 
I have also my mother's mirror on this side of the wall, which is an old antique piece. And to add my own touch here, I've made this colour here and I've made the colour on the wall. So I've used a paler shade on the walls as an emulsion and I've used an eggshell here on the woodwork. And the colours of the story are inspired by my green kimono. I love collecting kimonos, I've got uh, quite a few, but this is one of my more recent ones and I love the colours of this. So I've used this as the inspiration to make the colour on the wall, a muted version of it. And the lampshades are made by me. So these were plain white lampshades, lamp bases, and I used various colours of green and blue from the colours that I'd mixed downstairs to wash over them and to add in the streaks. And what I really like about them, particularly at night when it's dark outside, is that the colour comes through the parts of the material where it hasn't quite saturated into the linen. So if I turn it off, for example, you'll see it disappears. And then when I turn the light on, the colour comes through. So that was an unexpected surprise, which I really liked. This is a statue from Italy again. She actually came on a very tall plinth and I couldn't fit her in here. So she was um, a statue from my grandfather's apartment. Um, I think she's probably about 150 years old. She got a little bit damaged in her transportation, but she's, she's very happy there. And every time I look at her, I just think of Liguria in Italy and I just think of that sense of being so happy when you see the sun and the beautiful colours of Italy and being by the sea. I love vintage luggage. I think luggage makes really good storage spaces um, for things that you don't really want to see out, such as hair dryers, brushes, all that sort of paraphernalia. So I use two here to store items. I've also got another really lovely one here, which um, I inherited, which has stickers from travels all around the world. I think it's such a lovely, quirky piece. Again, storing items, which I want to keep, but don't necessarily want to use on a daily basis. In the wardrobe, which has the long hanging spaces where I keep my kimono collection, and I tend to use these um, sometimes for styling shoots, sometimes for my um, colour consultancies. They're very old. Um, I don't really have a favourite one because I love them all. Um, and I think what's great about them is that you can wear them with jeans, you can wear them just as they are. They keep you warm, but they also keep you cool because they're silk. And you can jazz them up with a really funky belt, um, even some cowboy boots or flat shoes or some heels. Uh, they're just absolutely great. I get a lot of colour um, inspiration from these and in fact this is exactly why I chose the colours on the wall here inspired by the green kimono. Um, and also when mixing belts with them um, such as vintage pieces of silk so you know you could take something like this fantastic pink and tie it around the green kimono and maybe have a pair of pink shoes or a clutch bag or some earrings that match with the pink and you've just got an outfit straight away with minimal effort. It's, it's just brilliant for me, it works, I love it. Most people who are going on a colour journey when they're renovating or decorating are undergoing a change in life. Now that could simply be that they're moving home but that is a change in a chapter of their life. In some cases, people have separated or split up. That's another change. Or perhaps they're going from just two to three with the arrival of a child. And I'm very sensitive to this when I walk into somebody's home. Usually the colors that people want or need tend to be relative to the situation they are in or the situation they want to grow into. So sometimes when I'm with couples, um, I have to mediate between one partner wanting a colour a certain way and another partner wanting a colour a different way and then reaching that middle ground or that compromise in um, helping them understand how they might want to live in this space together.
So the room that you can see behind me is the master bedroom. And when I first bought the house, when you came to the top of the stairs, the bedroom door started here because of the wood panelling wall that was dividing this um, bedroom here, which is now the dressing area. So when I reconfigured the space, it enabled me to bring the bedroom door further back to here, allowing a hallway to the reconfigured bathroom, which we'll have a look at later. So come into the bedroom, I'd love to show you. This space here is south facing and has just the most glorious sun in the afternoon. And so the colour that I used on the wall was a very rich amethyst. And the reason for that is because it reminds me of the rich colours in the sunset sky in Liguria. Over the sea, there is a certain type of lilac that appears at sunset and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper at night. And it's that colour that I wanted to capture. So I've washed the walls in that colour, whereas for the woodwork, I've used something a little more contrasting, which is quite pared back and goes really well with the Cuba cloths, um, like this one here, for example, that I was explaining earlier on as part of my African collection. I have quite a few of these, but here's just one example that I drape over the doors. I love to drape material over doors. I think it's a great way of accessorising a door, which is otherwise just very plain and simple. So I always encourage people to drape beautiful fabrics or textiles over doors. In this case, I'm using Cuba cloths and I have another framed version here. And then I think one of the best features for my bedroom here is similarly to the downstairs living room where I have that woodland scene. I have here a collection of images which every single painting I've sourced from a charity shop find. I've thrown these up on the wall in a slightly random way but at the same time trying to balance colour. So for example you will see that I have a lot of green and purple and blue here but I've balanced it with a painting on the left hand side that's quite heavy with the greens and the blues as well. So they are randomly put up in terms of how the space will allow it, uh, allow the painting to go up. And they're generally scenes of buildings in places or uh, the human form, such as the angels down there as well. Um, and another one down here. And they vary in age. So some of them are antique, some of them are mid-century and some of them are contemporary. One of the favourite ones that I like to look at is the one that I see the first thing in the morning and the last thing at night when I go to bed. And that is the scene of Portofino, which is where I like to visit when I go to Liguria. Uh, again, another charity shop find. Uh, it was a real thrift buy. And I remember when I saw it, it had lots of frames in front of it. And all I could see was this top part here. And I just knew straight away that's Portofino. And sure enough, when I pulled away all the other frames, uh, there it was. So that's what I like to wake up to and go to sleep to every day. And I have one more very small salting pot in the bedroom to the collection downstairs. And that fits really neatly inside the fireplace there. Because I like to layer and I like to layer vertically as well as horizontally, I have used over in the corner of the room one of the antique uh, water vessels I have and I like to just keep a very simple display of either eucalyptus leaves, maybe a rose. In this case I've got some branches with some spring buds that have come on there. Um, it's very simple but it's very effective for me. I absolutely love the whole philosophy behind the concept of home. It's something that I've studied and focused on for a very long time. And that's partly because I've moved so many times over the past 20 years and each time I've tried to find the essence of what actually makes a home a home. And what I've come to realise in the later years is the essence of a home is really what your story is with it and how you feel that you are translating that through colour and through the objects that you collect. It is so important to have a narrative with your home, with your space, because nobody else is going to have the same home as you. So it's really important that you can get your inspiration from magazines and from online platforms, but you need to be able to edit those choices and curate it in a way that makes it a soulful one for you so that you can have that story with your home.
And there you have it. You have what I've called an aesthetic narrative. And that's something that I specialize in and try to help people achieve. What is their aesthetic narrative? The soul of their home. What I love most about my home is the movement of light and the mood of it. It's a very soulful space. It has dark moments and it has bright moments. So without doubt, what I love most about my home is the way the light moves throughout it, which gives me a chance to experience the spaces in different ways throughout different times of the day and indeed throughout different times of the year. So adjoining the bedroom is the bathroom, which has a little lobby with an antique mirror from Italy and a couple of sea scenes, um, paintings. And then you come through to the bathroom, which is slightly different in colour and that's because I had one rule which was I wanted the decorative objects and the colours that I used to remind me of my childhood in Italy when I used to swim in the sea in Sardinia. And so the colour that I chose for the tiles is a very particular type of chartreuse that reminds me of swimming through seaweed in Sardinia. There's a spot where I sometimes go the colour of the seaweed is so particular and when you swim through it, you are literally submerging yourself into this beautiful chartreuse. So the green tiles have variations of this colour, so it's not a block colour, it's not a matte colour, there are different degrees of the colour in there. So when I'm in that space, I'm literally submerged again into the seaweed. And to kind of play on that a little bit more, I've got this fantastic succulent plant which really does look like some of the seaweed. And just like the rest of the house where I have themes, I have more themed paintings here which are of sea scenes, shells, boats, um, random pictures that I found in random places again. And I love to do that maximalist thing of overloading the space with lots of paintings. Whereas the antique bookcase here um, holds some of my most prized corals and shells and sea urchins. The sea urchins are in fact what I used to dive for in Italy. So I have lots of these just sitting around and quirky books such as The Wonders of the Shore and some antique corals that I've picked up and the abalone shells. I used to play with the abalone shells actually um, like marbles in the beach in the sand and I think the drama of the bathroom here really is using the curtains instead of shower curtains which I pull pull over a little bit more when I'm having a bath. I light all my candles in there and it's just an experience. It's really relaxing, it's beautiful lighting and it just really gets me ready to shut down for the day. The candle holders here are the Fleur de Lis symbol which is again playing on my surname and a bit like the um, the grate in the fireplace downstairs. They were a gift from an interior designer friend and um, they're great, they work really well for me. And I didn't want a conventional bathroom, just like the kitchen isn't conventional, so I sourced a cabinet that was the right size for me and a fantastic large basin and had that mounted on top. So again, it's that very relaxed look in the bathroom and I've put two of my very old urns from my very early floristry days that I've kept and um, they decorate the windowsill just right for me. In the corner I've got a couple of oars, boat oars, which I thought was quite a quirky little touch and a great sea scene again of a woman by, by the water. When I was designing the bathroom I decided to use the original panelling that I found behind some stud work in the wall here when I was repairing. So this panelling here uh, was actually the original woodwork used on the inside of the wall here. Um, not so much at the time the property was built, um, more so when it was probably renovated a long time ago, but 
it was so beautiful with the variations in the colour that instead of disposing of it I decided to adapt it so I could use it as the the panelling for the bath instead of having a conventional panelling or um, plastic even. This bathroom really does set me up for the day. It's a great space to come into. Um, I find it very relaxing and uh, invigorating at the same time. The word home to me means a space where I can transport myself to beautiful memories of my past, things that I cherish, and a space where I can grow as a person. Hi Homeworthy, I'm Skye. This is my home in London, come on in. You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Like and subscribe for more. Hi, I'm Sky McAlpine, and today we're in my home in London, um, which is a Victorian townhouse in southwest London near the park. Um, five stories, so it's very tall with lots of stairs. It's really good exercise going up and down the stairs. I live here with my husband, Anthony, and our two boys, Aeneas, who's 10, almost 11 years old, and Achille, who is four. I read classics at university, so I, um, I've always had a soft spot for um, classical literature. So they're, they're two great, um, or two of the great um, Greek and Roman heroes. So Aeneas is the founder of Rome and Achille is just the Italian for Achilles, um, the Greek hero. So they're, um, I just thought they were really beautiful names. So I am a cookery writer or I started as a cookery writer. So I write cookbooks and I develop recipes um, and contribute to magazines and um, various platforms online. And two years ago nearly now, I launched my own tableware range as well. So now I'm also a small, small business owner. <laughs> so I've, I grew up in Italy, I grew up in Venice. Um, and so it's impossible, I think, to grow up in Italy and not love food. Um, so I've always been very greedy and I've always enjoyed good food and good meals. Um, but I think I also, I was very lucky that I grew up in a home where food always meant more than, you know, it was always more than just the sum of ingredients. It was always more than lunch or dinner. It was always an opportunity to bring together friends and family or new friends, old friends. It's always kind of a very social moment and a very happy moment in the day. Um, so I think that's where my passion for cooking for others and for bringing people together around the table really started from. And then everything else kind of stemmed from there. So the cookbooks and the tabletop, that's all kind of like an extension. They're all kind of pieces in, in the puzzle. Well, welcome to my hallway. Um, it's very small and narrow and it leads straight onto the kitchen and the living room. So we didn't really have too much to work with with this space, but we wanted it to feel still kind of quite special and very welcoming. Um, so the starting point was this wallpaper, um, which is hand painted by this wonderful artist called Alistair Peebles, who our friend um, Ben Pentry found for us. And we came up with the design together. So it's inspired by antique um, Swedish wallpaper. And then when Alistair was painting it, he wanted to incorporate elements that were kind of representative or that in some way captured the spirit of me and my husband. So my husband loves birds. So we have all these beautiful birds. And then I love um, fruits. So there are pomegranates and lemons as well um, in the wallpaper. Um, so it feels, it's, it's very, very special for us. And so that kind of is the sort of big impact element of the hallway and it leads all the way up the stairs to the living room. And then we needed 
a table but it's a really narrow space um, so we wanted to get kind of like a half moon half moon table to sort of create that sense of hallway and also somewhere to just pop all our bits like I have this lovely antique um, brass basket where I just kind of put all the keys and and clutter um, so we found this one at an antiques market and it's just a simple marble top and then a kind of really pretty um, ornate wooden carved um, design around the edges and then I just kind of try and fill it with a mixture of useful things like keys and wallets and sunglasses and hair bands like those kind of things that you're like grabbing when you're dashing outside of the doorway um, but also like I like to have flowers in the hallway this is a really beautiful vase ceramic 1920s vase that my husband Anthony gave me for my birthday this year and I absolutely love it and it's really clever it's kind of got these little holes inside it so you can kind of put the flowers and it holds them in a really pretty arrangement um, and then we have all our little pictures um, I love this one of Achille, our youngest, that his godfather gave us in this beautiful antique frame. So it's kind of keep this here. Um, and then kind of it, I also keep, you know, whenever we get given letters or if I host the dinner and there's a mem menu or something, kind of a memento of evening, I like to keep those as well. And when people sweetly come for dinner and send us thank you notes, I always keep those. And these are so beautiful. This is... Um, a friend of ours who's um, Matthew Rice, he's an incredibly talented illustrator and he sent us uh, very sweetly, adorably, a thank you note and he kind of illustrated the envelope um, so it looks like the steps, uh, our front steps. Um, yeah, oh and then I also love uh, this lamp which is a stalk. Um, so we found it in an antiques market in Brussels and it's a it's a stork kind of bird, which I think is quite cute. And then it had, I got it rewired and then added this really beautiful hand-painted um, lampshade from Rosie de Ruig, who I love, I just love her designs. I think she's incredibly clever. And this is just like a sort of pop of colour that sort of very lightly picks up the, the sort of dusty red of the, of the pomegranates and the wallpaper. One of the things that I love about this house is that it's an old house. It's a Victorian house. Um, so it has kind of really good um, bones, I'd say, you know, lovely high tall ceilings, um, kind of a nice sort of architectural structure to it. Um, but when we bought the house, it had been developed by a property developer, I think probably in the 1990s. And most of the kind of the charm had been sort of ripped out of it and kind of it had a very modern kitchen and um, very modern bathrooms. Um, the fireplaces had been taken out. Um, there were no cornices. It had kind of very contemporary flooring. Um, so it really kind of, um, and it had been quite cheaply done as well. So it really lacked soul, but the sort of outside of the house and the sort of structure, the bones of the house were, were magical. Um, and so we kind of knew that it had such potential. So we worked with a really good friend and completely uh, brilliant, brilliant architect uh, called Ben Pentreef, who um, very sweetly worked with us to kind of put some, inject some magic back into the house. So when we were talking about how the house, how we wanted the house to feel, I kind of, the things that were important for me was like lots of light. And that was one of the things that the house already had, these kind of big windows. It was naturally very light, but lots of color and to feel very cozy um, and kind of comfy and like it had kind of always been lived in um, and also welcoming. And, you know, for the kitchen space needed, of course, to work for me um, because I work there um, when I'm developing recipes, um, as well as like when we're having supper there as a family. But also, um, you know, I, I've ne never knowingly said no to a party. I love a good party. Um, so we kind of also built the kitchen or designed the kitchen in such a way that it's a very flexible space and you kind of move things around and have 20 or 30 people over for dinner when, when we want to. And now this is my favourite room. Come with me. 
this is the kitchen, come dining room, come home workstation, come tavola, tableware design station. It's kind of where everything happens. Um, so this, when we bought the house, this was kind of two rooms and the kitchen was actually down this end where we now have the dining room. And over here they had a sort of more of a dining area and we kind of knocked through to make it kind of much, a kind of really big light space so you can get the light from from both sides um, and it was a really big project we kind of put we put the floors in and we put the cornices in and the antique murano um, chandeliers so it kind of was very 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 different when we first got the keys to the house so this is our dining table um, so it's I think you comfortably seat about 12 and then if we have a big party I add extensions on so you can kind of have a table that goes all the length of the room um, and this is an I think it's an antique French one we found it again at a um, antiques uh, store and it's it's very beaten up and it's slightly warped and very gnarly but I quite like that because I think wood kind of becomes more beautiful and more characterful with age um, so it, here we are laid up for dinner. Um, these plates are ones that I created for my tableware collection, Tavola, and they're called the Lido plates and they're named after the beach in Venice is called the Lido and that's kind of like my happy summer place. But the inspiration for them is, you can see they come in pink and in yellow and I like mixing them together. And the inspiration for them is this kitchen. So as you can see, the kitchen is yellow um, which is my favourite colour, but inside, I, my other favourite colour is pink, so inside the drawers we kind of went for a sort of strawberry ice cream pink. Um, so I kind of love that the, the plates reflect the kitchen in a way, um, and they sort of work perfectly in this space. And you can kind of see as well, like we've got kind of pink candy stripe curtains, um, over here and then we decided to paint the frames of the window yellow as well to kind of just pop and match and match the kitchen. These are all plates on my windowsill so these are all um, samples from Tavola or plates that I've bought from Tavola uh, just for myself because I love them so much but we filled so we have this massive cabinet that we bought in Brussels in an, at an antiques market and then had reconditioned. So we sort of had it repainted. Um, it was like a sort of black, black. And then, so we sort of painted it a, a light shade of gray um, with this sort of delicate green edging that sort of slightly picks up on the chairs. And then we lined it with this um, really, I love quite sort of 1950s style Antoinette Poisson wallpaper. I'm a big fan of and then this is just like the most amazing thing we've ever bought because it's just I thought it was an infinite amount of storage and it is a lot a lot of storage but somehow I managed to um, have more plates than we could fit in here okay so for example this plate here is the inspiration for the blue and white tutti frutti plate and this is I think 1950s or 1960s um, British at Spode uh, polka dot um, and you can see there's this adorable like blue trim of the blue polka dots um, so this is very much the inspiration for the tutti frutti plates I found this at a flea market and only had like four um, so I kind of then wanted to make a version of this that I could have a whole table full of and hopefully other people could enjoy in their homes as well so everything kind of comes with its story or has a story and I love to mix and match vintage and um, new and even when something's new I kind of love it to have a story or a reason why it kind of behind the, behind the design I mean these for example this is a set that I absolutely love and I'm dying to reimagine in some way for Tavola it's just got this very chic um, blue and actually they come in blue and in turquoise but they've kind of got like six of one and eight of the other um, this kind of almost like a almost like a nautical rope around the edge but I just think they're so pretty it's just such a simple detail um, but quite distinctive 
and very happy, like it's a really sort of strong poppy, happy colour. I mean, it depends who you're talking to. If my husband were here, I'd have to say that I have reached my limit and I have stopped buying plates. Um, but but given that he's not, um, I'll give you the honest answer, which is, yeah, no, I, I, lo I love them. I mean, I kind of, I love, it's nice to have different plates for different occasions. Um, and, you know, I do love having big parties. So I actually do, it, it, part of kind of making it simpler and easier and more fun to entertain is actually having all the pieces that you need. So you're not kind of like, when I used to do it, I'd borrow some from my mother and then borrow some from a friend and this and that. Now I have enough that like we can kind of host as many people as, as we like. And you can kind of really change up the mood of the table very easily. And I just think it's such a simple way of bringing joy into your life. Like I kind of love if I'm having breakfast and I have it on a really pretty plate that suits my mood. It makes me feel kind of special. And then suddenly like my toast and jam just feels that little bit more exciting. I feel like I've got that down pat now um, because I love doing it. So I do it probably far, far too often. Um, but um, I, I, I kind of prepare everything in advance. And, um, you know, I've got my, my second cookbook, actually, A Table for Friends, was all about this idea. It's all recipes that you can cook easily, whether it's for two or for 20 people, and how to plan a meal um, when, when you're kind of catering for large numbers so that you can actually enjoy the party too and have a fun time rather than kind of be slaving away in the kitchen going quietly insane um, from stress and and, and exhaustion. So, I mean, I, I keep it very, very simple. I do lots of like big salads or big bowls of maybe grains or um, quite often I'll do something like, you know, cold roast beef that I can prepare in advance and then just slice or, um, you know, uh, some nice big roast chickens or, so, or something like that or a panzanella, you know, kind of with the, which is sort of just torn bread with maybe fresh tomatoes and a bit of fennel in there and some fresh herbs and some olive oil. So like really simple, simple things. So this is one of my favorite things in this kitchen, this collection of copper molds, um, which I've built up over years. Um, and they're all different, sort of, as you can see, lots of different shapes. Um, and ages and actually so they will have slightly different kind of textures and patterns and colorings but I quite like that and I use them for cooking um, I'll use them to make jellies to make panna cotta um, some even like this one I love this one so cute with a little teapot on top is really cute like if you butter it you can make kind of bunt cake you know like a nice sort of spongy cake in there um, but I also like for storage, I sort of have them on the wall and they double as decoration. And my absolute favorite, I mean, I don't like to play favorites, but my absolute favorite is the pussycat up there that you can see that a friend sent me and she found it um, in a shop and very sweetly knew that I would love it. And I'm obsessed. And um, sometimes I make jelly in it. And one time, this was my proudest, proudest moment, I made like a sort of black velvet jelly. So it was um, Guinness, and a little bit of um, Prosecco, I think I mixed in. Um, so it was black, so it was like a black cat, but then we did, I did set cream for the little nose and the little paws and the tip of the tail, so it had like little white nose and feet and, and tail tip, so it looked like a black cat. Um, for Halloween. So anyway, I, I, that's, my, that's my absolute favorite, but I, I love them all very much. I love the cherries too. Um, this is, yeah, my favorites. And then over here, I also have, that I'm obsessed with, this is something that we designed for Tavola. And we call it the Aurora box. And it looks like a stack of plates, but it's actually a secret box. And I genuinely find this the most useful thing to have in the kitchen. So they just fill it with clutter. I mean, there's like the boys' sweets in there. I've got some matches, keys. Usually there are like coins, cables, phone chargers, all sorts of ugly bits and bobs. And you can just sort of tidy them away in there. Um, and it looks quite pretty. But also it's quite funny because like quite often, sometimes I'll have a friend over and they'll like come over and be like, oh, I'm just going to grab a plate. And they think it's a stack of plates, but it's not secret box. So I love that. And then this is kind of the main part of the kitchen. The hub being our cooker, which is La Conche and huge. Um, and yet I still run out of oven space 
occasionally, but it's one, two, two double ovens and a small oven and then a warming oven and a lot of hobs. I've never run out of hobs, but I have run out of oven space. Um, but um, this is the dream to cook with, I must say. At our old flat, we bought a second-hand small Lecoche cooker and we were there for 15 years. And it, like, I loved cooking on it every single day. So when we moved in here and we were doing the new kitchen, I knew instantly the one thing that I really wanted was a really big, big one of these. And so this kind of was the beginning of the design for the kitchen because we had this huge cooker that we needed to sort of somehow fit in. Um, and then everything else was kind of built around that. I mean, I have a very, very sweet tooth, so I'm not gonna lie, I love baking cakes. Um, and I actually, the thing I probably love the most, and for this you really need time, so it's for those moments like when I do have time, but I love making a birthday cake. So whether it's for, you know, my sons, or for myself, or for my husband, or for friends, I just, the best, the greatest privilege in the world, I think, is to make someone a birthday cake. It's such a sort of celebratory moment. It's really fun to make, because uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm quite greedy, so I'll kind of like take a, you know, a sp I'll, I'll happily lick the spoon or lick the bowl once we're done. Um, but it's a really fun thing to bake, and then it's such a kind of like rewarding and celebratory kind of um, dish to share with others. So the other thing that I love about this kitchen, I mean, there's lots I love about this kitchen, but is this kitchen island, which is an old workman's table that we, I found it online um, and bought secondhand. And then we had it reconditioned. So we changed the top to be marble. So it kind of picked up and matches the marble worktops in the rest of the kitchen. And then we added on the wheels. So you can kind of wheel it around. So if I'm it makes the space super flexible. So for example, if we're hosting a big party, I can kind of wheel this out onto the terrace and then put trestles in here. Or, you know, if I'm cooking um, and shooting, I can kind of move it over to a different corner of the kitchen. And I love the space being flexible. I think that works really well for us. And then here we have most of our, a lot of our food storage, which is in jars and these open shelves. And the shelves are made out of old cheese boards. So when we bought them, they already had like a lovely patina and texture to them. It didn't kind of feel too new and jazzy. And then we added on these hooks to hang all our mugs. This is my strawberry mug that we did for Tavola. That's with a lovely kind of like braided handle that I love. But I've also like collected other random ones over the years, like Christmas mugs and then um, these are some mugs that I designed for Anthropology a few years ago. Um, so yeah, I love drinking tea from a mug. I always start the day with a mug of tea. So I love my mugs. So I don't know what the right way to make tea is, but I'm very lazy about it. And I kind of normally, I'll just have a kind of tea bag um, and I'll add a splash of milk and some, and some sugar. But if I'm having friends joining me for like elevenses or morning tea, then I will put special tea in the teapot and use a strainer um, and usually use teacups rather than mugs um, but not always sometimes it's just nice to drink from a mug because it's very cozy and com comforting to drink from a mug and then here we have our big sink and we've got two dishwashers one and two that one is now going to keep opening um, but which I love because you know I do so much cooking and there are a lot of pots and pans and a lot of plates that need washing up. Um, and it is the greatest luxury in the world, I've got to say, having two dishwashers is absolutely life-changing. Um, so I love that. And then we have this other little wooden table that's also on wheels. Um, so you can kind of move it around again, just trying to keep the space as flexible as possible. And last but not least, my um, yellow sunshine fridge, which I absolutely adore, just because it's such a happy color. I mean, what's not to love? Cheese. Lots and lots of cheese, um, milk, cream. Um, I love, I'm quite lazy, so I love some like chopped onion in the freezer. That we probably like always have, maybe a bottle of Prosecco or something like that. I mean, I, we've been away for like a week, so my fridge is gonna be kind of quite mortifying. Some veggies in there. Um, usually there are some like condiments languishing in a, in a far corner that have maybe been there a bit too long. Um, but yeah, butter, lots of butter. 
So I'd say the decor of our home feels very, it's very colorful. I love color. I always dress quite colorfully. Um, I don't own many black dresses. I'm always wearing lots of color. Um, I love vintage things or antique things. So I'd say our home has a lot of character. It's full of kind of quirky bits and pieces that maybe I found in a flea market or on eBay or here and there. So it's sort of um, maybe quite eclectic. Um, lots of, um, it's quite chintzy. So I love a floral, hence my floral dress. Um, so there's quite a lot of like um, floral prints um, and stripes as well. I love stripes. Um, so it's a mix, I'd say, of florals and stripes. Um, and the colours are all quite sort of like pastel coloured, um, other than this room, which is sort of, well, this is like, I think kind of like, I like to think of like the house as like ice, ice cream colours. So this is the raspberry sorbet room. Um, but our kitchen is more of like a soft kind of, I'd say, um, uh, custard, custard ice cream. It's yellow or like a, like, like a nice lemon sorbet. Um, and then we've got like pink finishes, like soft pink finishes that are more like a, like a sort of uh, a strawberry ice cream or a strawberry milkshake. Um, so I love kind of soft colours as well as poppy colours. Um, and, and just light and kind of, I mean, it's definitely a very imperfect home. It's always really messy. It's full of clutter. I love clutter. I love having all the things that I love around me. Um, so it's a busy, it's busy as well. So now come with me. We're going to go upstairs to the living room, living room study, part of the house. So this is our living room. Welcome. Um, this is the couch. Um, it's super comfy, super, super squishy. I've actually slept on this couch and it's unbelievably comfortable. Um, we kind of fallen asleep watching a movie and then um, spent the night here. But, and we had it upholstered in this uh, chintz that I'm completely obsessed with. It's a Jean Monroe design and I just love it. I love this intense blue and I love the big pink roses. And then we ended up actually having curtains to match in the study. So they kind of, it sort of draws the two rooms together a little bit. Um, but I could literally like live in a house that was covered in this chintz. I love it so much. But my other favorite thing in this room possibly is our, well, we use this as a bar. It's actually a 1950s Fornicetti fridge that we had um, restored so that it works. And we kind of use it as a bar. So we keep kind of all the Prosecco and um, drinks that need to be cold there and then have our sort of um, liqueurs and so forth on top. But I kind of love, you know, I love all Fornicetti things, but especially the old stuff, I think is kind of really the best. So I was very excited to find this. This fireplace we put in, um, because all the chim, you know, the, the fireplace has been taken out of the house, so we sort of had them put back in. And this actual, um, this marble fireplace, we bought in, in an antiques shop in um, Brussels and then had it fitted um, and, I, and, I, and I do love it. And it's nice and deep so you can kind of put, I haven't got anything on here today, but quite often I'll put, you know, vases of flowers or books or whatever. You can kind of decorate it quite nicely, which I really like. And then coming round, um, I, other things that I love in this room, this is a picture of my grandmother. Um, this is, I think it's the only picture I have of her actually. Um, in black and white, I think she looks very glamorous. So I, I love, I love this photo of her. And then here I have my sort of little trinkets, my scented candles, my matches, little vase of flowers. This is a Murano glass vase um, for, for the, that we do for Tavola, and it's the first design of vase that we did for Tavola. And in this lovely sugar pink was the first color. Now we make it in. Um, lots of other colourways and blue and like a sort of soft gold and you know clear with different things and but I, I think because it's the first one we did it's very very special to me so I always have that there. I feel like I always have quite jazzy lampshades. Um, I, I, I do like a colourful uh, lampshade. This one's quite faded now and it's 
uh, fabric, whereas most of our other lampshades through the house, I think, are, are paper. But I, it was just quite a beautiful e-cap print that I kind of really liked. And I think because the base is, is quite simple, um, it's nice to have a little pop of colour up top. Um, and then, I mean, I love our stripy curtains as well. So this is just the sort of red um, ticking, um, like a red stripe, like much thinner than the sort of pink stripes downstairs. And then here, oh, I love this. I've got my sort of bits and bobs, like random collection of vintage cookbooks. The Book of the Onion. I mean, isn't that not a fab cover? If nothing else, 150 ways of cooking it, um, the onion. Um, so there's this guy called Ambrose Heath, who was a very prolific cookery author in the in 1950s UK. And I buy a lot of his books on Abe books. Um, here he is again, vegetable dishes and salads, partly because they actually are full of like really fun um, and quite like unusual recipes in it by today's standards. But also because whoever was designing his book covers was supremely talented and they're all these like really fun, colourful, um, quite like iconographic um, covers, which I love. Um, and then this, I absolutely love. This is a portrait of our two boys, Ines and Aquila, that my mother gave me. And she had, um, I'd taken a photo of them in the bath and she, she, had, she had this portrait um, painted in oil. Um, so uh, I love that, that's very precious for me. So when I was about five or six, I think I was six years old, my parents moved to Venice. And the idea was, my, my mother had lived in Rome in her early 20s and loved it and fall, fallen completely in love with Italy and loved everything Italian. And so my parents really thought that, you know, it would be fun to live in Venice for a year, you know, almost kind of taking a year out. I was going to go to school in Venice, learn to speak Italian, um, and then we'd come back to England. But Venice is a very... Uh, special and in many ways quite seductive city so we kind of just fell in love and then never really left um, and then when I so I went to you know I really grew up there and it is for me home I'd say of all the places in the world it's the one that most feels like home um, and so I grew up there I went to school there and then when I turned 18 and I graduated from high school or liceo high school equivalent um, I came to university in England uh, which is where I met my husband and then after university my husband started work in London but I actually continued my studies um, for a few years um, doing postgraduate uh, work and then I became a cookery writer so I've sort of always had this great luxury that I as long as I have a kitchen and a laptop I can kind of work from anywhere. So I kind of, we fell into this habit of um, spending, I spent about half the year in Venice. Um, so I'm kind of backwards and forwards between London and Venice. So this is my study. Um, this is where I work often if I'm on Zoom calls or if I'm writing, sometimes even if I'm kind of focusing on design elements and I really want peace and um, and somewhere to concentrate and somewhere with a door that I can shut and kind of be alone. This is where I come. I love this room. We um, painted it this really like raspberry sorbet um, red, which I kind of really love because it's quite a sort of dark room naturally. So it sort of felt nice to kind of embrace that with the color. And it does feel very, very cozy. Um, so here I've got like some fun things that I've had framed. So that is, my mother had a food shop in London in the 1980s. So that's a picture of her in her shop. And at one point, my father also worked as an antiques dealer. So he had another, also a shop in the 70s or 80s. And it's a photo of him in, in his shop. So I quite, I quite like that. And then these are just um, menus from dinners that I've hosted in the in the past that were special to me in some way um, that I just framed the menus and I, I like to keep them, I keep all my menus. Um, and then this is kind of wall-to-wall -wall books. On this side are all my cookbooks, which controversially I've organized by color, which is um, largely because I just find it's quite hard, like I might not always remember the title of the book, but I pretty much always remember what the cover looks like. So I find this, for me, it's the easiest way 
to find my books, but I've got, I've, you know, I've got lots more actually, but this, this is my sort of core collection. Um, and I love them. They're my, my pride and joy and they've given me so many hours of fun. So this is my third cookbook now. Um, and this one is, this is a really fun book to write because it is a cookbook and it is, you know, over a hundred recipes or however many it is, I can't remember exactly how many we did, I did in the end, but um, it's basically a book about love. And the premise of the book is whenever you cook for someone, it's an expression of love. Even if you're kind of making someone a cup of tea or slicing them some toast and buttering it, it's always an expression of love. So the book explores different kinds of love and then um, to go with each chapter, which is about a different kind of love, are recipes. Uh, so there are recipes for two, for like romantic date nights. There's recipes for one. There's a lot of, there's a big chapter on self-love. There are recipes that you can cook for your family, kind of there's a chapter on unconditional love. Um, there's a big chapter on friendship and a like a big section on comfort food. So it was really, really fun to write um, because it's quite a sort of emotional book. Um, as well as being a cookbook, you know, and I'm a very greedy person. So, I mean, I love, I love cooking and testing recipes and, you know, um, but it was really fun. So this wall, I kind of end up, we were going to put pictures up, but actually I use it as a mood board and it's ever evolving and ever changing. So I put little things up here that I just love, um, you know, like little drawings. Um, if I go to you know, like if there's sort of an invitation that someone sends me that I think it's particularly beautiful or I really like the colour or the motif um, that in some way I think might be inspiration for, for a design or for something that I want to work on. Like, you know, for a long time we've been working on these little cards for Tavola, um, which are beautiful um, illustrated cards by Isabel Wilkinson. And... Each one is kind of, so this is like a little table setting. This is a, a tea moment. Um, but each one comes with kind of a recipe or some tips and it comes with things. So kind of when we were working on that, I had a lot of components up here. Um, so I always quite like this corner. It's always quite inspiring. So I, I mean, I definitely take a lot of inspiration from Venice. I find I do my best work in a way when I'm there, definitely in terms of writing or kind of bigger picture work, like kind of, thinking about new design elements or whatever it is. Um, I mean, it's such a beautiful city. It's impossible not to feel inspired in Venice. It's very peaceful. It's every, Everything's on the water. There are no cars. The buildings are very old and ornate and kind of beautifully made. So a lot of those elements sort of, um, sort of naturally just kind of feed into what I do and to, I guess, help to form an aesthetic that's sort of colourful and a little bit over the top, but not too perfect. Because I always think the buildings in Venice are kind of beautiful and opulent and stunning and so much, but then they're also kind of slightly crumbling or, you know, there's always an element that feels a little bit kind of worn in, which I think is the cosiness. You always need the cosiness. Um, at a table or in a room or, or in a space. Um, so I think that's a lot of the inspiration. And I guess in terms of how I cook, it's the food that I grew up eating um, that I sort of strongly associate with comfort food, with happy memories. So it's sort of a lot of my recipe inspiration comes from there as well. well I mean, I think the soul of any home comes from the kitchen. Um, for us, it's definitely the busiest room in the house in that it's the room that we spend most time in and probably where our happiest times, certainly as a family, um, are. are. Um, it's, you know, where friends come over to be with us. I love pottering around and, and cooking. Um, and it's it's a really colourful, it's a colourful room. So we went for kind of a, a really, like a sort of buttercream custard yellow, um, kind of inspired by Monet's kitchen in Chiverny. Um And it's a really happy colour. It kind of feels like sunshine, even on the greyest day, because London has a propensity. Today's quite a sunny day, but... Um, more often than not, it's it's quite grey and overcast. So even on the greyest day, it sort of feels like there's there are rays of sunshine in, in that kitchen. This is our bedroom. Um, 
I love this room. It's at the back of the house because the house is on quite a busy road, looking onto the park on quite a busy road. So it's nice because it's sort of quieter, quieter part of the house. I mean, the thing that I love most about this room is the walls. Um, and this looks like wallpaper, but it's actually fabric, um, which is feels so nice and is so nice for a bedroom because it kind of has that sort of like, again, sort of very cosy, very tactile element to it. Um, it's another opportunity for chintz, um, so more chintz. Um, but this was a roll of fabric um, that um, was sort of discontinued. And so we just did it for the, for the walls of the room. And I absolutely love it. Um, and then, you know, it's quite a small room, so it's really just room for this bed, uh, which is four poster. And then we had actually, we, we couldn't quite find um, a sort of second hand or antique or vintage for uh, iron frame four poster bed that quite worked for us. So we bought a regular bed and then um, Ben, uh, ben Pentry's design team found someone who could just add the posters on who could add, you know, make it full poster for us. So um, that is a kind of lovely detail that makes me very happy. And then what else do I have? This is my sort of corner where I, sometimes I sit. This is a cushion. It's looking a little bit well loved, um, but it's a, a cushion that I tapestried during actually during um, the first lockdown during COVID, it's like a, a peony. Again, it's my favorite colors, pink and yellow together. Um, but I love doing needlepoint. I find it very soothing and relaxing and very rewarding. So that's one of the cushions I made. Here are other ones that I've been making, but I need to have, need to finish off and have turned into cushions but then it's really nice to have them around the house and you have the memories of the time that you made it does he love florals i don't think he loves them as much as i do um but he he does he i think he he's he he, he likes the sofa and he likes um the, the walls in this room i think he he doesn't mind a floral but i wouldn't say he's as into them as I am. And then I love it. I mean, I love this bedspread. This is more florals. This I think is actually preen, but it feels quite vintagey. And again, it's yellow and pink, my favorite colors. Um, I quite like that it's reversible. So you can kind of use it both ways around. And so change up the room a little bit by um, turning it over. Um, and it feels really smushy and cozy. Um, and then oh, I also love this. Um, this chinoiserie um, bureau. I kind of always wanted a bureau and I kind of use it to store trinkets and, and everything. But it's just, you know, if I'm writing notes or I want a space to work in the bedroom, I can kind of use it as a desk as well. This we actually found from an antiques dealer um, called, now his name escapes me, but an antiques dealer in the Cotswolds. Um, and I saw it and I just had to have it. Um, I'd always wanted one like this. Um, so I completely fell head over heels for it. So from the bedroom, come with me through to our bathroom. So this is our bathroom. Also kind of doubles as a dressing room. So you've got kind of all the clove storage over there on that side of the room. And then, I mean, I've got to say the thing I love most about this room is the bath. Um, this was originally two small rooms, so this floor, well, this floor actually was kind of two bedrooms and two small bathrooms, and we sort of knocked it through to make a small bedroom and then a, a generous bathroom come, come dressing room. Um, and the thing I was completely obsessed with, the thing I wanted more than anything was a copper bath, um, which is here, and I must say I love it. I mean, I'm definitely a bath person rather than a shower person. And it is the coziest thing in the world to have a copper buff because, um, because it conducts heat. It, the whole thing kind of warms up gently. So kind of when you lie back against, against the, against the buff, you don't kind of, it doesn't feel cold. It feels nice and toasty and warm. And I think there's a lovely glow from the color of the copper as well. So it just you feel very, very cocooned. Um, but I love my buff. And then this is a, a, another um, fireplace that we bought in, in, again, from a different antiques market, actually, in Brussels. And then we put in 
This was sort of inspiration. We took inspiration from one of the fireplaces at our flat in Venice that has um, tiles as well as the actual fireplace. So we had these lovely sort of Delft style tiles um, put in, which I like and makes it feel very different from the fireplace down in, in the living room. So these are quite cute. These are um, little houses little blue and white houses, Dutch houses, and they're um, from KLM, the Dutch airline. If you, I mean, I bought them from a flea market, but apparently if you fly business class, they give you one of these little houses and they're all sorts of different designs and shapes that you need to collect, um, filled with, uh, with, with alcohol. Um, and so it's like a, a tiny little collector's. Anyway, I just thought they'd kind of go, I bought these, like I say, second hand, but um, it's a small collection that I want to build on because I think it goes quite nicely with the Delft tiles. Yeah. Sorry, these, these are meant to go on the wall. These, these are going to go on the wall. And um, my mother actually gave them to us for Christmas. They're painted by someone called... Um, uh, well, her, her line is Josephine Dessine. And she, she does custom plates. So this is me with my, my cookbooks that very sweetly my mother had made. And then this is the sort of matching one to go with it. But they're too beautiful to eat from. So I want to have them um, mounted on, on the wall somewhere. But I haven't got around to it yet. And then this is a portrait of my grandmother um, looking very glamorous. So it's nice to have her in here. And then um, in terms of... I mean, this is a freestanding mirror that we bought in, again, an antiques market in Brussels, but I absolutely love it. And actually, you can see, if I close it, you can see the doors of the mirror, which I don't actually get to see so often, have this sort of beautiful um, pattern to them. So even they are quite special. Um, this is my banjo bag, which my um, a friend, uh, Charlotte Olympia, designed, and I'm completely obsessed with. Is possibly the thing I love most. It's a handbag, but it looks like a banjo. Um, and then I've got other little favourite bits and bobs hanging here that I use. Um, and then this is a little um, table that we also got in Brussels, and it's just kind of useful storage for like bath salts and bath oils and scented candle and nice bits and bobs. And then these are our wardrobes. Here's my shoe cupboard. I love them. I mean, I'd say, so I've got maybe two top favourites. I love these because they're tutti frutti. So there's like the banana and the watermelon and the um, pineapple and the strawberry. I absolutely love these. And then I also love these, which are, I mean, both pairs of these shoes are I'd say not everyday shoes. Um, these with the lips, the hot lips. And they're both Charlotte Olympia, um, old ones, but still very, very beloved. And I kind of love, we put a sort of toile de jus behind. So you have that toile element. Home means, I guess somewhere cozy and somewhere that I can share somewhere that I can bring the people that I love into. So it's, I mean, typically as long as I've got kind of a table and a way to kind of make toast and tea or something, um, I'm happy. But it, it's somewhere where I can be with the people that I love and spend lots of time with them. Hi, I'm Worthy. I'm Luca. Welcome to my home in London. Come in. You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Be sure to visit our website, homeworthy.com, to discover amazing furniture, art, accessories, and more, all handpicked by our editors to help transform your house into a home. All of the items are inspired by the episodes you see here on Homeworthy. Enjoy! 
I'm Luca Ruffin, I'm interior designer and we are in my flat in Bloomsbury, London. So this is a terrace house built in the late 1920s, I mean I think it's 1929. So we're moving to Victorian architecture but still very Regency, still very classical and that's why I liked about it. And it's still in a very nice bit of London because London has been bombed during the war but that street has been entirely kept alive and protected, etc. So it's very nice, it has a very nice atmosphere and you know there are these very typical terrace brick houses in London and it's it's great. And the house through times has been changed and altered. Nowadays it's um, divided in two different flats. You have a downstairs and a uh, um, I mean basement and um, and the ground floor flat and you have the first floor, the second floor flat and there's little yard at the back, which is very nice in summer. So I started my professional uh, life as costume maker. I, I studied costume making, historical and theatrical costume making in Lyon, in France. And I started that life. I worked in Paris and in Normandy, where I'm from, uh, for, for, for a few times, uh, for short times, and then Covid happened. Uh, I moved to Britain and I tried to work in the performance world in Britain but with Covid it was very difficult and I decided to do a shift of career and to into designing. I haven't been trained into it so I'm a self-taught one um, and I'm self-employed. <laughs> I have my little company called Caligula Supernova Interiors and I've started the 7th of October 2022. But I had a proper launch in um, June 22, 23, sorry, uh, with an exhibition called Ten Objects. Now we are in the entrance hall, which is shared with the flat upstairs. Being a shared space, it was quite tricky uh, because it wasn't very pretty and it was very difficult to alterate. And so it was really a very light touch to make it nice but unpersonal so it's just you know dado a bit of paint a few print as you can see which are 18th century french and a very simple side table so people just can walk and pass and without being shocked by oh we are in the house of someone else even if we have to go upstairs to another home so just like that it was um, very quick and easy to do <laughs> So now follow me into the dining room. The dining room is interesting because the house being divided in two flats, it is a bit upside down. So you have the dining room on the first floor with the kitchen and the bedrooms and the sitting room on the ground floor. So here we are in the dining room and it's a mix of French Italian uh, antiques. So you have amazing Italian screen, which is 18th century from Northern Italy with painted scene from Comida dell'Arte. And you have another piece, which is quite important. I talked about my exhibition uh, back in June about the 10 objects and this painting was the peak of that exhibition. It was a cell exhibition and this is a 17th century Italian painting by the studio of Pietro da Cortona and it uh, represents a very classical scene which is Anciocus in Trasmice. It's a very interesting composition, very classical and you can see it was painted by different hands because you have different qualities of executions. I mean the hand here are very good, same with the feet and some drapery. And then you have the little Cupid which is not the best, you know, he's a bit chunky, the perspective is not the best, but it's very nice. And it was from, um, it was in a lovely country house in Northumberland. Here we have an amazing, also Italian, it's a lot of Italian stuff, a Piedmontese mirror. It's 18th century too, and it fits perfectly the space. It was the, you know, the bit when I bought it in auction from Christie's. It was like, would it fit, would it not fit? And it did, and it's perfect. You have also amazing 19th century uh, candelabra here, which are after Van Cleef uh, candelabra from the early uh, 18th century. On the mantel, you have something which is very British, 
Uh, it's, you know, when friends or, you know, when you have people coming to stay, etc., or families, and you cards or thank you letters. It's very British things or invitation to some events to lay it on the mantle of the fireplace. So I kept the tradition and because I like it, it gives a little, you know, when I talk to Leah about a house which is lived in with a little light touch objects which make it lived, <laughs> I, if I can say, those are part of those things that make it more personal, not just a set. And you have that also very nice French ormolu uh, candelabra in the style of Louis XV. And that table, that table, it's, yeah, it's rather nice. Um, it's, uh, I found it by, you know, in advertence, by a little mistake. Uh, it's uh, from a little antique dealer in Alsace, and it's uh, original Charles X, so 1830. It's quite pretty. And the chairs were original too, so, and there was a wedding gift for the person who commissioned it in the 1830s, 1820s. So it's really nice. And, and yes, and they all have, you know, different provenance, interesting histories. It's, you know, they come from, you know, different palace or whatever. I mean, that screen is interesting uh, because uh, recently there has been a cell from uh, the Guinness family, from one of the country houses. And in that cell you had not a copy, but I would say a little brother of that screen, which was shorter, with very similar scene and very similar painting. So it's interesting sometimes, you know, uh, as an interior designer, if you work a lot with antiques and through auction houses, you can find some items which are similar or part originally from the same lot, but has been divided. And that's quite, quite fun. When we moved here, um, it's interesting because it was rental flat, it is still the rent flat, um, and the room were quite different. They were all tired, but the, the dining room where we are at the moment was fuchsia wall and with awful wall lights and, and the kitchen was blue and yellow and you had a very nasty carpet through the entire place. And it wasn't very, I mean, it was tired, it wasn't, uh, uh, it wasn't looking very nice and it was just shouting of, of help me <laughs> to, to be made, uh, I suppose, pretty and, and lived in. And yeah, and what happened in 2020, uh, at the end of the first lockdown, moved here. And just at the right moment, because the landlord was on the way to redo the flat because the lease of the former uh, occupant came to an end so they planned to strip out the kitchen and remove some stuff and we're just like no 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 the kitchen is so great don't touch it we'll, we'll, we'll manage the work just if if we paid for it we'll manage the work and 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 what we did so uh, we just repaint the kitchen and did some different work I mean we removed them all the carpets from from from, from the house and um, thankfully the first floor still had its um, floorboards but the downstairs, they had nasty concrete floor. So then we added um, a lovely reclaimed uh, parquet floor from a Victorian house from Northern London. And now it looks much better. <laughs> and of course, uh, if you have a dining room, you have a kitchen. Let me show you the kitchen. It's not historical kitchen. It has a lot of charm. I mean, it must have been purchased in the 1980s, but it's, it's quite pretty. It's a bit knackered in some places. Uh, but yeah, it was quite tricky with that uh, flat um, because it has a lack of storage space and it was finding some little way to gain storage space. So for example, we had to put a drawer dishwasher under the sink so it's easier just there. It's easier to gain all the space so we can have a washing machine. We don't have to go to the laundry all the time. And um, yeah, uh, in the room, uh, little objects which are quite nice and important to my eyes. So there, you have three pieces of art, which is, uh, one is lithograph from Picasso, but, which is very pretty, but that one is quite important to me because it was made by a friend. Um, she is a Romanian and Bulgarian artist. She lives in London and she did a lot of her work based on her sad love stories and 
you will see different portraits through, through the flat of her ex-boyfriend. <laughs> uh, so this is one of hers. Going back to the storage place thing, um, storage, uh, yes, in the place, it's not very efficient. So every time there is a little space, like the fireplace, which is not usable because the flue has been blocked, it's a good opportunity to use it as a storage place. And being in Britain, picnic is a tradition. So you have two sets of picnic baskets. So if you want to go to Hyde Park or Green Park or Regent's Park during the summer or the spring, or even sometimes the winter for the bravest of the earth, uh, it's very useful and nice to have a picnic set. And inside, it's very funny objects that I bought in Normandy for a couple of quid. Um, some of you might recognize that. It's 18th century port de chambre. It's basically 18th century loup. And, but it makes, if you remove the lid, a very great flower vase for big, big flower um, arrangement. So here we have here a very nice a china set, which is interesting. It's antique again. <laughs> I really like antique. It's um, uh, blue and white china. And these, actually, two teak balls, which are late 18th century, are original from China. Same with the teapot. And what happened is they have been shipped to the UK and a company that which is very known, I tried to find, I couldn't find, so it's basically Meissen. And they made copy of it and a set entirely with, you know, because at the time coffee was more popular than tea, so they made coffee, coffee, coffee cups and you know, little milk job, etc. And it's very delicate, it's very pretty. It has been used through time, so you know, the, the, um, the teapot has been mended with a little bit of silver. The lid has been broken too, but uh, I still like it. It's very, very nice. It's a lovely blue, and just the gilding added by the British uh, is, is very delicate and it's very nice, you know, when you have tea, you know, uh, with friends or guests. I don't drink like I don't drink it like the English. I drink it very dark. I don't pour any milk or sugar in it. Uh, I know there's a huge debate of if you pour the milk and the tea after, etc., or the, the 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 tea first and the milk after. But I'm not doing that. I'm just drinking the tea on its own. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, it's quite interesting having a conversation about tea with British people because they love their tea. <laughs> the house. Uh, being a rental flat and being you no know, delivery, etc., had a lot of potential and a lot of things can be done to it. Um, the space gives a very nice surface and, uh, yeah, and not being part of the interior designing world at the time, it was more to create a space which is very personal. Uh, I, used to, I was still working in the theatrical world, you know, as a costume maker. And, uh, yes, I went for different things, you know, I had different questions, you know, should I do very French interiors, should I do very British interiors because we're in London, should I do a mix of things, and I went to the mix of things uh, to, um, to, to, to do a bit of continental influence, a bit of British influence, and I started to source antiques, uh, mostly a piece of art, uh, it's not much of art, it's a little collection, it's, it's a good start. Um, but um, especially object with a history, which is important. I mean, when I, I'm looking for some stuff, I like know where it's from, if I had a little background or something like that. And so you have quite interesting pieces in the, in the place and I'm quite pleased about uh, just for the value, history, uh, you know, the, the historical, I mean by not big history, but little history value and what it um, you know, talks to people about and what it represents. And of course, aesthetically, it's nice too, but uh, it, and it's quite, and it's trying to create a balance between all that ob those objects. I love to cook. Being French and having grew up in France is a bit cliche, I know, but I've been very lucky. My parents always cooked. We had a veg garden at home. So always fresh projects. I grew up in a family where we had quite a bit of land. So we had, you know, apple orchards, you know, cherry orchards, so fresh fruits. 
and uh, it's a lovely area with a lot of different projects you know which in terms of the meat seafood fish and it's uh, it's quite great to be able to grow up and being taught about food and then now I do love to cook and I do love to entertain that's why I wanted a dining space in the flat and with the dining table and the kitchen which is actually usable <laughs> and not just a little cupboard to do things so it's quite great and and being able to do things and cook and having different dishes and and stuff like that and just you know make nice food not necessarily sophisticated but just nice simple food that when people eat one of the best compliment it says oh it reminds me for example my childhood or you know some very precise memory something like that it's uh I think the best compliment about cooking. So as you can see, I do like a bit of drink. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so there's a nice collection of uh, champagne bottles. I mean, uh, I always start a party or a dining party saving champagne. It's, I think, a very easy but nice way to do. I mean, you can see they all depend on what there is on promotion in Waitrose. <laughs> if there's um, yes, a sale on some bottles, I get more and you know, this is a bit of diverse. I do like, actually, uh, a very precise brand of champagne, which is a very small uh, champagne producer from, from France, but I can't find it in, in Britain, which is quite annoying. Um, but yeah, so, nice collection of bottles. It's uh, quite, I suppose, shows the tone when people come to the house and see the bottle of champagne. They know it's a house where they will party. <laughs> it must have been less than a year when I moved here and the house in the street was having a makeover and there were, you know, it has been lived in for 50 or 60 years by the old lady and she passed away and, and they sold the flat and etc. And they were emptied it, emptying it and in the streets it was just like a junkyard and they were binning that plaster bust of Apollo Belvedere so it has been rescued from the street. There is one thing, I mean it might sound a bit narcissistic um, there is a portrait of me made by a very dear friend uh, of mine, which are painters, portraitist painters, called Philip and Chloe Kath. And it's not because it's a portrait of me, it's because it's a portrait made by very close friends, very dear friends. So more than, you know, a piece of art or whatever, it has a sentimental value. And, you know, all the process of being painted is quite intense. You really have an exchange with someone. It's not just sitting there. It, you, you know, you talk, you have a moment of, of deep talk and you, know, you can talk about silly things sometimes and then you have quite a moment for 20 or 30 minutes or even an hour and, you know, it's for quite a long time and, and it's quite great and, and it's all what represents that painting, I think it's, it's why I should pick it up as my one favourite object. Now we'll continue to see the rest of the house Follow me downstairs then. So, the staircase is in very small space, um, lined with this very nice stripy blue wallpaper. I really like blue and stripes. It's uh, something very classical but nice and you can't go wrong with it. But, um, yeah, because it's a small space, we wanted to do a little bit of, you know, warming it's with um, a lot of pictures and especially that one is very important this is the painting made by my dear friends Chloe and Philip and uh, it was painted in summer 19 when I was still young and beautiful <laughs> no it's it's very nice it's uh, it's they're very talented and, and I, it's a very important piece for me so if we continue that way you will see more different works in the staircase so this is part of the drawings made by my friend Steffi, one of her ex-boyfriend. You have little cornflowers that I collected uh, from different places. I really like cornflowers and different drawings and prints found in different places.
We're now in the sitting room, which is the more comfy area of the, of the place. And because it is upside down, uh, the light is not the best. Even if we have a big window, thankfully, it's still quite dark, but it's nice in winter evening. It can be very cosy with all the candle lights. Uh, because I don't tend to use the spotlight any more. I mean, I, except for cleaning and tidying, <laughs> practical things. Otherwise, I lit the room by candles and it goes very, very cosy. And yeah, and it's, uh, it's um, a very nice room, I think. It's a good size. And especially if you have people coming and, you know, after having supper, you have a you know, coffee here or you start with the drinks here. It's, it's very nice. Uh, yeah, I want to point you the floor, which is uh, that amazing uh, parquet floor from the, from the Victorian school. And more than painters, uh, my dear friend, Philip and Chloe, are also good, as we call truffle pigs for good things like that, and they found it. And they say, oh, I know you were looking for something like that, so we found that. Would you be interested? And I was like, yeah. So they, they, they got it for me. It's, it's really good, it's really pretty, and it makes them, I mean, lift the room and, and the space, because the problem being in a basement, it's quite low ceiling, and you know, you don't have much windows. So it's difficult to make it glamorous or at least nice. <laughs> uh, so that parquet floor adds a lot of character to, to it. As you can see, I suppose you might have noticed upstairs, I have quite a few Pelagonians. I'm very fond of those. Also, they're very classical English. You can see them in a lot of interiors in Britain, country houses or even town, you know, in flats or houses in town. Um, yeah, they're very nice. They bring, you know, nice scent and they have lovely pink or white flowers. So there, as you can see, you have a nice painting by Luke Edward Hall. So I, I've met Luke in 19 now, and I had a little things for, for personal projects about having a bed and breakfast in Normandy to save my family house from the ruin. And this was planned to be in the house, but the project didn't happen. So you came to London. It's a very nice, uh, Nice painting of, of men having fun and party with a martini drink. I don't know if you can see. <laughs> and there too, the drinks. <laughs> Important having a good drinks table when you have guests come. So these armchairs are 19th century in the style Louis XV, they're French. Got it from Christie's. But um, the place where they used to be, I think, were just decorative. They were not meant to be sat on because the silk is rather fragile it's lovely gold green silk but having people sitting on it has been worn off it gives a bit of 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 of, of what they call gentry or country house condition but uh, sadly the um, it has been you know upholstered with them um, sort of 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 cotton watty thing which is not prettiest. I was thinking about changing it, but I really like the colour of the silk, so I don't know yet if I will change them. Maybe in time, if I find something rather nice to remove and replace the silk with it. So that big tapestry behind me is quite special. It's um, a lovely scene from uh, Don Quixote. Uh, you have Sancho Pancha being left in the air by the peasants. Uh, and uh, you have um, Don Quixote just there watching the scene. And it's, uh, it's a very nice tapestry, which might come from Sorders or Thorthobies, I don't remember, from an Astacel. And it's um, Brussels, uh, but it's, uh, it's a bit snackered, has suffered. Uh, but it's very pretty. I mean, the faces of the people are very good and it's very nice. Still colour, and some of the colour faded a bit, but it's very decorative. It's, um, it gives a warm atmosphere to the room and a rich atmosphere too. Uh, and that tapestry used to be part of 12 depicting different scenes from Don Quixote. And it was a very popular subject in the 17th century and early 8th century. And 
terms of personal style, that place, I think, could be qualified as classical with a bit of eclecticism. <laughs> I know sometimes people will pose these words, but uh, I mean, you have some tone which are, which are very classical British, like the bone through, through the house. Uh, but also having, I mean, that screen, which is amazing piece of, of art on itself and a very useful space because you hide a lot of things behind screen. It's very good for storage and that place needed a lot of storage. So, and, and so you have those eclectic pieces of, and with um, very traditional, I mean, the, the, um, the fabric of the building is quite traditional. It's very traditional British. So you have this classicism with the staircase, you know, the, the pine wood uh, floor uh, and fireplaces, etc. with some, some, some uh, not usual furniture for Britain, I would say. So it's a mix of things. And yeah, I, I, I mean, I have a very important source of inspiration for for interiors, which I think is one of the high peak of, of, of um, interior designer. He wasn't an uh, interior designer either. He was a fashion designer. He was Hubert de Givenchy. He had such a good eye for, for sourcing amazing piece of arts and, and, and furniture and gathering them together and creates very, very good interiors. And so I tend to try to uh, reach that aesthetic. So uh, I don't know if I succeeded, but I'm very pleased with what I've done with the flat. <laughs> it's very, it's very nice uh, uh, um, home to live in. Even if with the flat, I try to create a balance and you know, kind of a, a journey. When you st you still have differences between the rooms. You start with the dining room, which is quite minimalistic in a way, if you can say, because um, I mean, some objects are still very obviously huge um, and have a huge present, uh, presence. Uh, but uh, it's much more simpler in terms of tones compared to the sitting room. So it was a bit of the things where, you know, in the dining room, especially I use it mostly for dinner parties, so it's lit by candlelight, so you, you don't really see the rest of things. And when you have your, you know, your, your dessert you're pudding, and then you transition to the sitting room. And after having a long and nice dinner, you want to sit soft and have a coffee or a digestif. And you want this, you know, I don't know, that kind of cocoon atmosphere. And having, you know, richer, fabric and more, you know, uh, sitting surface, which this amazing 8th century day bed, for example, you can fit four people in it, it's, it's great. It gives this, you know, nice uh, warm atmosphere and welcome atmosphere, which is, which is great. Uh, you know, just calm down and just sit there and you have your coffee or drink and it's great. The coffee table is from a, a brand. I don't know if it's. I mean, they know. I know they sell in Britain, but I, I think they're French. They're called AMPM. I know it's a very funny name for a French brand. Um, they do uh, good, um, good designer pieces for good price. I would say, um, even if there is a lot of antiques in the room, I want still a bit of more modern pieces. And especially coffee table, uh, the co I wanted a coffee table, but because the room has really much of presence with the sofa, with the cushions, with the chairs, with the tapestry, I wanted something which is which was lighter. And the fact that it's glass and brass, and it's lovely polished brass, it's not too heavy visually. And I like books, as you can see, with the bookcases <laughs> and the coffee table. And especially, I think, book, even if it's first to cultivate yourself, to grow your spirits and to learn, it's also a very nice object of decoration. <laughs> and, and it's a shame sometimes to hide them when you have beautiful covers. Um, I don't know, talk about a story uh, or magazines. I mean, magazines, you know, they're created with amazing covers and, and it will be sad to hide them in the bookshelves.
sometimes you don't have choice, but if you can display them, it's great. I mean, I have a few different books, which, um, oh, one particularly, from a photographer that you must know. He's very famous in America. It's Lee Marin. I mean, this is one of his many books. It's Dolce Vita, and I love his work since I'm a child. So let's have a look at the fireplace. This is uh, hiding the back of the fireplace, which is not very interesting. Um, this, on the other hand, is interesting. It's a Charlie's Vell. It's 18th century, early 19th century European. So it's from a um, nunnery in Britain, who was created in the 19th century. And they had an amazing archives of religious and liturgic fabric and clothes, etc. Uh, because they used to embroider stuff for the Church of England. They closed down and uh, they were doing a big sale, but for nothing, basically. Um, and I got that amazing um, uh, Charlie's Veil, which uh, is red and it's Catholic. And the red in the Catholic Church, um, especially for the liturgy, is used for the Pentecost. It's lovely, it has gold thread, it has painted silk. Um, on it. It's, uh, it's a very nice, very nice, delicate piece of art. And you can find a the fireplace on the mantel. The same things as upstairs, the collection of postcards, invitations and thank you cards. <laughs> Before leaving that room, I just want to point a very discreet piece. Discreet. It's maybe not the word, because it's quite massive. It's an amazing solid marble bust of mercury. It uh, was made by a friend of mine called uh, Corin Johnson. He's an amazing sculptor. He's based in Clerkenwell. And uh, yes, he, he made that for the Georgian Group exhibition back in 2017. And then he had it, and there it is. It's, it's, uh, it's so great. It needed plinth, but I like it on the floor. It has a bit of modern art things. But uh, in good time, a plinth will be there, but it's so heavy. <laughs> that it's impossible to move, and to lift it, you need a very strong person, that I'm not, and, uh, and you need a very solid plinth too, so in good time, you will receive the plinth and be lifted. But yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very good. It's after the antique uh, from um, a statue, it's a very big statue, where it has little uh, backers on his shoulder. I think London life is great. I really like living in Britain. It's a very, very nice country. I really like it. I mean, I've always been familiar with Britain. Uh, when I grew up, one of my best friends, she was British. Her mother was Irish and her father was British. And they, I mean, they, they were in Normandy. And so I've been very close to British culture and something that I'm very fond of. I think I will make the, good part of my life in Britain. I might go back in Normandy. I mean, things, you know, are never settled and, you know, you can change, etc. Normandy, you're f somewhere else in France. But I think at the moment, I'm very pleased to be in Britain. Now we should go into the bedroom. The bedroom is, uh, I think was actually the most challenging room in the, in the flat because it's very small. And it was the question of the storage space, of the bed space, and uh, what to do, and how to make it nice and quite you know, a bit impressive sometimes, even if it's not a room which is mostly shown to, 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 to guests or friends. Sometimes, you know, if you have a little snoop when they're looking for the door to the bathroom and they have, ooh, that's interesting. <laughs> so, yes, and I'm a great believer in small space, big thing, where you can have, you can allow yourself to have an impressive thing in small space because it makes the things even more impressive. I'm a bit delusion of grandeur. So, there you have a very small bedroom with a very big four poster bed with amazing silk. <laughs> It was built for the space. <laughs> so the, the bed, uh, because the space is so tiny, had to be built in. So it's um, bed base that has been bought and then you know, wood and then has been covered in, in silk. So it was literally built in for the space 
to fit in the space. There is no way you could uh, manage to bring it in. The bread drops, the curtains are actually old curtains from eBay. They are very pretty too. Um, they were found with the help of my dear friend Chloe. She's, she's very nice and she's very good at finding this stuff. It's very nice when you can have friends with good taste, but also good at finding some stuff. <laughs> the question in that room is the storage space. And, uh, you know, with the side of the bed, you can't have a chest of drawers. And it would be a bit sad to have, you know, something already bought as a wardrobe, um, because also the space between the mantel and the wall is not very deep. So when for building a bespoke uh, wardrobe, it's plywood, but it's covered with a very, very nice hand-painted wallpaper from de Gournay, which make it very glamorous. So, there you go. You have a look on my clothes. <laughs> As I said upstairs in the kitchen, uh, fire mental, uh, fireplaces actually, can be very useful storage space when you don't have much um, storage space. And there I hide my <laughs> suitcases and all the travelling bags uh, in it. And because it's not very pretty, I mean, you don't want to see your suitcase or bags. I've used a very nice, um, can be used as a rug, as a tablecloth, or as a bedspread. It's a very nice woven fabric from Tangier in Morocco. And it was made by, by a lovely, lovely man um, and uh, had a very nice conversation with him. It's the, he's the third generation of Weaver, and uh, his son will take up the business. And, and they're so pretty, and you have different colours, it's so nice. And they're so good qualities, so I had to buy him some. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, I really like um, Tangier and Morocco. It's a very, very attractive culture to me. So I needed to have a bit of it in my place in London. On the mantel, you have a little painting, a little portrait, which is Charles II, um, dressed as a Roman. You can't really see it, but there's a lion on his shoulder and there's tassels. But that painting, which is the most interesting, is a travelling portrait, because you have a little... If I move there, put it from the bottom. You can travel with it. And I think that was originally from the portraitist himself. So it was a bit like your portfolio. You travel to a client and show him the different things you can do. But to protect it from the journey, because travelling to carriage, I suppose, was quite uh, different from travelling from the train or an airplane, or just sending an email with a, with a portfolio on it. Um, you had to protect it, so it's very nice to have, still have the little shutter to, to protect it, and it's a very, very nice, delicate picture. What makes home come alive? I think is when you try with your home, or yeah, when you try to make it yours. You know, when you start to make it represent who you are, you know, at your best. And it doesn't matter if it's not perfect, you know. You know, you always have little bits of things falling down or crumbling down because you can't keep everything pristine. But it's part of the history and of, of, of how things move and things change and, and how, you know, sometimes you can pile books in a room or in, it's these little things, these little objects, you know, light touches that can make it very personal, can make it home. It's not just not a pretty set, it's a space which is lived in. A space where you can feel okay to live in, where you feel comfortable. I think comfortable is a good way to put it. Where you're not frightened to sit on a piece of, you know, on the chair or on the sofa, or to touch a piece of furniture. It's not a museum, it's lived in. It's on the door. There is that little piece, which is not very much, um, but um, I was, I said I used to work in, as a costume maker, so this I made for, for uh, dressing a party for, for a birthday. It's a Regency waistcoat from, uh, yes, with a lovely uh, fabric from Pierre Frey. When I did my first tutu, 
was quite emotional because the first one, it was for for um, a Swan Lake, uh, but for children. So a short version of it, in Paris for Théâtre du Mogador, and uh, so it wasn't the best in terms of quality and the most beautiful. But because it was the first tutu I've ever made, it has the little emotional bit of it. Um, otherwise, I, during my costume studies, I made it quite a lot of historical costumes, which was quite nice. I liked doing that. The most pleasing is when you see something that started from an idea and ended into physical things on stage. And the same with interior designing. When you start from an idea and you end up with a house or a flat or whatever, a real. So what was the thought is now real. You can see it, you can touch it, you can feel it, you can live it. What does the word home mean for me? Hmm. A place where, where I feel always welcome and pleased to come back, I suppose. It's a very generic answer, but uh, yeah, where where I'm in it, I'm not feel sad. Where I can relax, I sp you know, when you have social life. I mean, I do love to entertain here. That's why I, I wanted a, a practical and usable kitchen where I could cook and have a nice dining table. Uh, so I can have friends and people to come and have supper or lunch, etc. It's great. But also, Having friends is nice, but sometimes it's also nice to have a moment to relax, a moment of your own. In home, I suppose, it's a place which can do both, and you can feel yourself, and you can have people that you care about coming to yours. Hi, I'm Worthy. I'm Kemi. Um, welcome to my home in London. I call it Cottage Noir, and I'd love to show you around. You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Be sure to visit our website, homeworthy.com, to discover amazing furniture, art, accessories, and more, all handpicked by our editors to help transform your house into a home. All of the items are inspired by the episodes you see here on Homeworthy. Enjoy! Hello everyone, I'm Kemi Lawson. We're in Stanmore in North London, in my home, which I call Cottage Noir. This house has a very long and interesting history. We think it was built around 1750, 1760. And it's actually two cottages, two workmen's cottages. One was a bakery and one was where the, the baker lived. And sometime in the last 20 years, the, house, the two cottages were converted into one family home. So the walls are about this thick. They're really thick brick, brick walls um, with a lot of kind of lime plaster, natural plaster on them. Um, it's got lots of fireplaces, lots of wooden beams, um, which we think have been repurposed from some ships. But this is very much a family home. I live here with my husband and my two little daughters who are 10 and 12. And it's got a lovely story of kind of continuous res residence from people from 1750 up till now. And I know so much about this house because when we moved in, we inherited this lovely book which was full of information about the house that successive people who have lived here have filled in from the census records in 1760, so we know the name of the actual baker, up until people, you know, living 20 years ago in the house and the kind of work they've done. So it's a it was a lovely feeling of we're now the new custodians of this house and then we'll pass it on to the next family when we move. I immediately knew I had to move in when I came into the house because I just love the aesthetic and I love the energy that I felt in the house. I termed the way I've decorated this home as Afro Aristo meets Caribbean Nan Chic. Now let me explain what I mean by that. Our heritage is Nigerian and Jamaican and I've de definitely drawn on these two different kind of black heritages to inform how I wanted the home. So I've got a lot of kind of fabrics and textiles and art and colour that remind me both of my childhood spent in Nigeria and also of my mother's country, Jamaica. Welcome to the Cottage Noir hallway. 
As I said, this is very much a lived-in family home. It's my daughter's 12th birthday today, so you'll see balloons and cards, which we use to celebrate today. And I'll talk you through a few of the other items in this room. So the first thing you see when you come in is this wallpaper, which is a black and white wallpaper that I saw from this designer in Haiti called Yela Valerie. And what they are, if you look closely, are little houses. And these are Haitian houses called gingerbread houses. And it's what the Haitian aristocrats and the powerful people of the 1900s used to built to live in. So if you remember before, I said my aesthetic was kind of Afro Aristo. I wanted to show the high end, the luxe of the African and African diaspora experience. And these gingerbread houses really encapsulate it. They're really clever houses. They're very climate, um, very cool inside and hurricane resistant and they're also architecturally really beautiful and there's lots of different ones all around in the wallpaper and then it's such a great wallpaper you even see a little lady um, lying down reading outside the house it's really detailed and so I love the idea of you're coming in a house and then you're seeing houses which I also extended here which I have art of lots of different houses again and what's special about this particular painting is along with the book I was telling you about which talked about the, ha of the house's history I inherited, inherited this picture of um, the actual cottage that I live in that was, um, and I'll, we'll keep, leave it here for when we move for the next people to live in. So it's a lovely kind of memento of cottage noir. Um, over on here, I have the console, which of course is full of all the kind of Doritos of family life. But on top, I have a few things that are quite special to me. Um, the first of this candle. So we've got into designing our own things with the cornrow. And one of the first things we designed is our own candle, which we always have burning here. And we put a phrase on it, fine girl. So we spent our childhoods in Lagos, Nigeria, and it's a real ubiquitous phrase out there. You hear fine girl, fine girl. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like something everyone says and always brings a smile to people's faces. So that's what we call the candle. So we have a fine girl and a fine boy candle on site. And I also have this, which I bought at auction. It's so pretty. Every time I look at her, I just can't stop. Um, it's called a lobby head, and it's also from West Africa, but this time from Burkina Faso. And they're meant to be protectors of the home. So I thought it's quite nice to have it as in the front as well, because she's going to protect our home. And so I love the energy of it. And I also love her cornrows style. My daughters often wear their hair like this, and it's lovely for them to see it represented in art as well. One great thing about living in a cottage, it's full of quirks that you wouldn't necessarily have in a modern home. So this window, we're not quite sure what it was, but we think perhaps this is where it wasn't a window once and it was a little opening where the baker might have dealt with their customers um, kind of through this, through this hole here and that's now been made as a window. But regardless, it's brilliant because it lets all this light into hallways. Cottages are usually traditionally kind of dark places, but it's a, it's a great avenue of light. And of course, I've put some, I put a little, little picture of my husband there to kind of jazz it up a bit. But yeah, it's great you notice it. We've even got smaller windows upstairs. <laughs> it's full of interesting features. One pot of sadness for me is that I've mentioned a lot about Yoruba, which is my traditional um, culture, but I don't speak the language and neither do my children. However, we're trying so hard to introduce it to them. So what I thought when we moved in is I would get a custom rug and instead of welcome, which of course rugs traditionally have, it will say a cabo on it, which is my language Yoruba for welcome. So every time someone comes in, they'll see a cabo written here. And I tried, I got a font kind of like a handwritten font. And so it's a great marker as soon as you open the door that you can see that this is a proud British Yoruba home. So let me show you my living room. My professional journey has been a real pivot. Um, for about 15 years, I was Miss Finance. I worked in investment banks. I worked in valuations. I was all spreadsheets and working in the city of London. Um, what happened is I had a big kind of change around the same time that I moved into this house because I just so enjoyed decorating the house and finding and sourcing things that I loved, I wanted in my home, combined with the fact that I found it so difficult to actually do this because it was very hard to find this kind of modern Afro Aristo Caribbean and chic aesthetic that I was telling you about, I realized there was a business opportunity here. Um, so I decided to kind of ditch the finance, which I realized actually wasn't my fat passion anyway. I've always loved history and heritage and art. And so this felt much more me and set up a business with my sister called The Cornrow, where we would be, as it were, an, a curation, an edit, a one-stop shop for people who wanted this kind of modern Afrocentric aesthetic that I just adore.
I am so lucky. It, it really is a breeze working my sister, and I'm not. I'm not just saying that. We've just got very. We, we agree on the important things in terms of our, what we think is beautiful and our aesthetic and what we want out of the business, and we also have complementary skill sets. She's very good at kind of the digital marketing side and that kind of the business logistics side, and then I work more on the creative side. So, so it really works. And if we ever have, have an argument, then our mum can sort us out. <laughs> so here we are in my living room. Um, the first thing about it is there's two fireplaces. One works and one doesn't. This is the one that doesn't. So then I thought, okay, let's have a lot of fun with this in terms of interior design. And I got a black and white geometric tile kind of all through it. I made them lay it randomly, which actually is harder than it looks because just, I just didn't want it to look at all like it had a plan. And so they managed to pull it off and I'm really happy with it. And I was very lucky that I found an artwork that really complements it and a blind also with black and white geometric. So it became a real um, theme of this room, which I loved. And I loved how it contrasted with the walls, which I've made put a kind of a seagrass um, effect so it gives it really kind of textural effects because I wanted it to feel kind of the room to feel like a warm hug not at all kind of cold and clinical um, and then I had these two areas here which I thought would be great to make bookshelf reading I refuse to go on to kindle I buy all my books and so I need as much space as possible so I filled it with books and also this little mementos wedding photos my first going out handbag just things that were really special to me on top here I have two dolls right here, which um, are a really good example of what I mean by modern Aristo. So these are dolls made by a Belgian artist who was really inspired by South African and West African doll culture. There were some lovely dolls um, which, which people used um, in West Africa, um, which were plastic, and everyone knows these little baby dolls. And she's turned them into these wonderful ceramic um, dolls and kind of decorated them in that black and white geometric um, vibe, which I love so much. And they're also available on the corn row and we think they're really special. Um, I've also got these two um, leopards here, um, which are rep rep reproduction Benin bronzes. So the Benin bronze is uh, one of the most prestigious, amazing art forms coming out of Nigeria. You might have heard about the siege of Benin where the British colonialists ransacked it and took a lot of the um, treasures to British Museum and other places. And always, there's a continued debate about they should be sent back to where they belong, which is in Nigeria. And so I've got this to kind of, as they're so beautiful artistically and also reminds us about our, her our heritage as well. These two, are my, these two ladies are very special to me. They're called Aisha and Shade. Um, they've got the most magnificent, proud, regal expressions, and I can't imagine having a house without Aisha and Shadi there. Um, they're some of our most popular products in the corn row, and everyone who buys them just loves them so much because they're just powerful, badass, wonderful women to have in your home. Sourcing things for the corn row is a kind of all of the above strategy. We always say we're on foot and we're online. On foot, we look a lot at um, auction houses, even eBay, sometimes you can find things. And also, of course, traveling. My sister just came back from South Africa. She got some wonderful things in Johannesburg and Cape Town that we've just put on the site. So we're always looking. And then online was is such a great resource for us too. Um, we were a business that burst in lockdown, so so much of the business has been online. And we've met other creators and makers and which we've then put their products on the site and built relationships. And so that's been able to give us such a broader kind of, you know, you can't travel everywhere, but online you can. And um, so we've got things, we've built relationships with people in Haiti, again in South Africa, in Nigeria, in Ghana. And so that's just mean, you know, the whole globe is at our dispersal, finding these products that we think are special enough to be part of the cornrow edit. So yeah, that's this side of the house. And then again, I've got some artwork as well. I'm always on the lookout for this. I think I was just walking down the street and I saw this person selling art and I was like, that's Grace Jones, isn't it? And he's like, yes. And so I, I picked that up. And um, then I have these dolls. Actually, this is the doll I was telling you about that was the original dolls that children in the 50s and the 60s used to play with in Ghana and Nigeria. And then these are the modern version. So you can kind of see the whole story, the whole transition there, which I thought was really nice. My husband and my two daughters play um, the piano and the saxophone. In fact, we're really happy today because my daughter just found out she passed her grade five exam. So that was great. 
The other side of the living room is the business end with the TV and the sofa, which we all kind of come in chill. I love cushions. I kind of, if I ever see a cushion, my eyes drawn to it. We sell a lot of them in the cornrow. This one, I've seen in another home worthy house tour actually. It's by a wonderful South African designer called Shine Shine. And then this one is by a Hayton designer, Yela Valerie, the same lady that did the um, gingerbread houses and another wallpaper that I'll show you when we go upstairs. We had to do the sofa custom because uh, of course being a cottage, it's all got different lumps and bumps and we couldn't really buy something off the shelf. So it's kind of cut off to fit the mold of, the, of the, the walls of the cottage. But the good thing about needing something custom is I could choose whatever I wanted in terms of fabric. So again, I was looking for something that kind of brought in the kind of West African symbolism imagery. And I thought that really worked with this kind of stripey design that I, I sourced over here in London. Something I'm very proud of is this war art, which is called an Asafo flag, which is from Ghana in West Africa. And it's a kind of dying out form. It's kind of hand, it's hand done by these artisans who kind of cut out these, cut, cut out the fabrics to make it this flag. And traditionally they were used as part of military companies. So every military company on this area in the Ghanaian coastline had their own flag. And you, because and when you would see the British flag here, which is quite interesting for an African piece of art. And as I said, these people were coastal, so they had a lot of um, exposure to kind of the British Navy and everyone who's coming up in the terms of colonialization. So they used some of the motifs from them. This one is, I really wanted this particular flag for the house because of what it represents, which is a proverb. And the proverb is about the welcoming tree, which bears fruit. So you can see the tree here with lots of fruit and all the animals from the snakes to the bull to the birds are coming to, to enjoy the tree. And that's how I want the house to feel, like a welcoming tree and people coming to enjoy, you know, to enjoy being with us and our company and the hospitality. So that's this Sappho flag and which we also, we love them so much. We have um, more bookshelves here, um, which of course I'm, I'm very proud of and I've started to collect some edi first editions and stuff. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how that develops. I was really excited about these two chairs because they're black and white geometric. And I was looking for chairs and we had no chairs here for ages because they had to be the perfect chairs. And then when I saw these, I was like, we've got it. Um, we've got the again, other cushions. Now, one thing about cottage noir is everything has an intention. There's nothing just here for, for, for being here's sake. So our cushions, this isn't just any old lady. This is a Haitian revolutionary freedom fighter, Sanente Belair, who died for the Haitian revolution. And she um, is, again, this is this wonderful Haitian artist, and this is her cushion. And on this side, we have a representation of an ancient queen of Benin. So again, I've talked about Benin Kingdom. It's very important to me, the story of Benin, and it's lovely to see the queen here on my cushion. So draped on the chair is a throw. I love the color palette. I just think it goes really well with kind of black and white and warm aesthetic of the living room. And embroidered on the throw is an expression that is really powerful um, for the black community. It says, the blacker the berry, the sweeter the juice. And it's an expression that basically really speaks to the colorism that's so often in society um, and lets my daughters know that, you know, deep, dark brown skin is beautiful. And then, you know, talking, as I said, about the modern Afro Afrocentric aesthetic, another example of that is this bean bag here. So the fabric, it couldn't be more ancient. This is called Adire fabric. It's made in Nigeria. It's like hand dye. Adire means to tie and dye. So it's a tie and dye fabric done by hand. Um, everyone is completely unique. People traditionally used it for clothing. But I wanted to modernize it, so I've made it into a bean bag, which I don't think has ever been done before. Um, but I thought it was a great way to kind of have an ancient tra traffic, sorry, an ancient fabric, but within a kind of modern context. Um, here you have um, kind of more books and artwork. This is a lovely Ghanaian fertility symbol. I'm a bit wary of holding it because two girls is enough for me, but um, it's a very powerful and very beautiful piece of art. Um, this I picked up on travels to South Africa, a little handmade ceramic. I love it because it's like three ladies done really lots of beautiful detail here. And I love the colors as well. You know, so many times when people think of um, West Africa or African art, it's bright primary colors, which is great, but it doesn't always have to be like this. And oh, I've just love, one detail I love about this is they've all got little babies on their backs. As you see, that's how, it's actually <laughs> how we all carry our babies in, in West Africa.
This is something I picked up recently um, in Paris, in the flea market in Paris. And I asked my daughters and I came back, can you guess what it was? And they, they couldn't guess. And I don't blame them really, because it's actually a pillow. So um, traditionally um, in West Africa, you'd have these beautifully ornate braided styles and you wouldn't want to ruin it, would you? By sleeping, sleeping flat. So people would sleep on um, things like this to elevate their head. And what I love about it is it's just something very functional, something to elevate your head, but somebody's taken the time to carve, um, carve and paint it beautifully. And it's quite unusual to see something painted quite so vibrantly. So it caught my eye immediately in Paris and I was like, bonjour, this one please, and my best friend, <laughs> and managed to secure it. This is a working fireplace, um, but again, I've put things in here which I think kind of I love it because you've got this traditional 18th century English fireplace but then I've got African masks here as well and then this geometric vase which we we love and also saw in the cornrow and then it was important for me to put cotton in the house now people have I've read on the internet it's quite interesting different different views about having cotton as an aesthetic in the house as a, as a black person particularly as a black American person Obviously, there's a lot of ties here with um, cotton plantations and slavery and all that. But and so I did think of it myself. What I was thinking of it as kind of celebratory and a remembrance, really, better than celebratory, a remembrance of kind of people, of ancestors and what they've been through and what they've overcome and, you know, the beauty in that. So that's why I think it was lovely to put cotton in, in the house. I think my favourite thing in my home is something that's in my bedroom. It's a framed work of art which was given to me on my Yoruba traditional wedding when I got married 15 years ago. And it's a letter that's been handwritten on handwoven fabric, um, which is a, tra it's a traditional letter that the groom's parents give to the bride's parents asking, please, can Kemi become married, come, become, come into my family and marry our son? And it's so beautiful, it's such a beautiful work of art on its own. And then it's such a lovely message that my in-laws have written to me. And then on top of all that, it's a fundamental and wonderful part of my ancient Yoruba culture. So it's kind of three in one. I think of it as a family heirloom and I really hope my children and grandchildren will have it in their house somewhere. And it's again, as I was saying earlier, it's uni unique and special to this family and so priceless really. Then I would like to talk about this coffee table, which is an auction purchase. It is um, a repurposed coffee table. It was not built to be one. If you can see, it's got a giant slab of wood underneath which we think was part of maybe a church or some kind of municipal building, you know, the other way around. And so the, that has actually often, that has obviously been taken off the building, chopped up, turned around, and someone's put a glass on it. And hey presto, it turns out to be a piece that's perfect size for the, um, for the coffee table, sorry, for the sitting room. Um, and then on top of it, you know, another space to store all my books, <laughs> which I have uh, kind of rotate them depending on what I've just purchased or what I'm dipping in and out to, in and out of. So I've got my books here and I always like to have books in case the girls might be interested in reading something, trying to get them to read as much as possible. And then finally, inside the books, you'll see this here, which is actually a board game called Ayo, A-Y-O. And it's played a lot in Nigeria, but actually across West Africa and quite a lot of countries in the global south as well, actually. My daughters play it quite a lot with their husband and it's very, you need to be good at mental maths. And it's kind of like you move, the, you move these around the board in order to get certain numbers in each certain, um, in each certain hole. And so it's a lovely, aesthetically, it's a beautifully carved piece of wood, but it's also a fun game to play. Let me show you the rest of the house. Let's start off with the kitchen. I would say my personal style, I would say, is kind of modern Afrocentric. Like, I would hope when you, I would be pretty sure when you came in this home, you would know that was somebody of African heritage or someone that was very close to, the, to, to Africa and its culture and its soul, but in a modern way as well. Um, so not just, when you think a lot of times people think of kind of Africa, West Africa, you go to rural scenes or safari scenes and all this kind of stuff. And that's just not my way. When I go back to West Africa, to Nigeria, that's not what I see. I see a modern, vibrant community. And so I wanted to bring that in as well. 
Um, also the fact that it's a family home, it was so important to me that I wanted somewhere that my two children could have a relaxed time, nothing too precious here, um, things that will inspire them. They're having a sleepover on Saturday, things that their friends will, you know, come and en enjoy being in this environment. So as much as I wanted it to be visually very kind of represented of my heritage, I also wanted it to be a warm, welcoming, fun place to be. Welcome to my kitchen. The kitchen's actually the room I did the least with. It was quite a good um, kitchen cabinets here already and I rather use the budget on the rest of the house. But the one thing I did do, as you might be able to guess, is just choose a bright green color um, to repaint all the cabinets in. I wanted something fun and vibrant to kind of encourage me to be in the kitchen as much as possible because I'm not the most enthusiastic chef. And also the kitchen is very close to the garden, so I wanted to have that kind of feeling of bringing the outside in. It was quite hard to choose the right shade of green because you can you might go to paint shop and there's like a million different greens and I knew in my head exactly what I wanted. So I was so excited when I found this one and it worked out. I did commission one thing for the house though, which I couldn't resist, which is this which is a mosaic actually um, by a lovely artist, UK based artist called Dion Ibley. And we talked about it a lot. I wanted it to be mainly green because of the green cabinets, but I wanted it again to represent this kind of modern, modern Afrocentric vibe. So what we did is we took two fruits, the Aki fruit and the Scotch bonnet fruit, one which is really popular and I iconic in Nigeria, which is Scotch bonnet, which makes all our food really spicy. And then the ackee is the Jamaican national fruit. So she made little mosaic Scotch bonnet and ackees in various stages of ripening and kind of put it on here. And it's a great dual purpose because it's a splashback to protect my walls. And it's also kind of really aesthetic and celebrating my culture and heritage. Other thing, again, as I always say, that always makes me smile is that everything is intentional in Cote de Noir. So even our tea towels, you know, we don't have regular, like, checkered red and white tea towels here. This one here is um, Toussaint Louverture, which is the, you know, I, you can tell I have a bit of a love affair with Haiti. He's the Haitian, Haitian freedom fighter that won independence from the French. Absolutely amazing. Um, in the 1700s and the story about him and his image is here on the tea towel which is lovely and again I'm hoping a little subtle history lesson for my daughters and then even my oven glove here is brilliant it's um, hands black hands because again it's what we said about representation you know it's black people living in the UK often you know you look on the tv or in shops and you don't see yourself anywhere and i wanted where it really resonated at christmas when i was looking for black angels for my girls for the christmas tree and i couldn't find any and but it's not just at christmas so when i found products like this which is great and it's got names of black musical stars across the ages i was like i need this in my home and then of course to sell in the cornrow as well which is where it's really popular well, this cottage is just on so many different levels. You had one step down to go to the kitchen, then two steps down to go to the dining room, which I, I wasn't planning on showing the dining room today. I'm kind of in between doing some interior designy work because there's a dining room and there's another room at the back here, which is a shame, but I can't show you. They're not really ready to film, but you can just see, you're right, the different levels and upstairs again, lots of steps and everything and everything like that and then of course these wonderful beams that you'll see going across the house that we painted in various colors two girls you need a lot of organization organization isn't my strong suit so as much as i can write things down and schedule things is, is best and so when i saw had this wall here i had the idea of using chalkboard paint um, rather than ordinary paint and so that means that I can kind of write and rub off quite easily so I've got the week schedule of what the girls are doing every day which is really helpful and I also have more space here which we kind of use as, 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 as needs be so it's just ways to help me be organized and actually this wall is pretty interesting because here you know, to have a random kind of <laughs> key here, which we think is something to do with the original baker's oven. No one's really sure, but uh, it's kind of like a fun little quirky thing in the house. Next, I want to show you a super cool secret door we have. 
you'd probably get two different answers to whether my husband was involved in interior design, depending on who you're talking to. I definitely was, definitely was involved and I kind of gave him options of things and made sure he liked everything so he didn't just feel kind of like swept away by it all. But I was lucky enough that he kind of handed the reins to me. I mean, one thing is he does have a man cave, which he did choose a lot of the decoration and the furniture there. So that made him happy. But the overall aesthetic, I'm to credit or to blame, depending on what you think. <laughs> If you look down there, you'll see what looks like a bookshelf. Um, it even has a light fitting and a skirting board at the bottom to show that it really is a shelf. But it's not actually a shelf. This is actually wallpaper and it leads into my husband's man cave over here. <laughs> so again, we wanted the house to be fun and surprise visitors. And so this was really important for us to kind of, we saw a door and we thought, what can we do to make it interesting? Let's head upstairs and I'll show you the bedrooms. As you head upstairs, you won't help, you can't miss um, this wallpaper that I've put in this corner here. This is a wallpaper about the six ages of black womenhood um, from Yale and Valerie, um, and the Haitian design I mentioned earlier. And it's got a woman representing um, different, different eras of black womanhood, back to the Benin Kingdom, which I was telling you about, to kind of, to freedom fighters in the US, sorry, not this one, this one is a freedom fighter, Catherine Cleaver, the US civil rights movement. We've got Sanita Belair, who is a Haitian revolutionary. We've got a woman um, who kind of crystallizes kind of every woman looking after her family. And we've got a woman here who is a spy at the Haitian Revolution. Where is she? I'm um, here. And really managed to get lots of secrets out of the French. So tell, each picture tells a huge story. And what I love about it, not only is it bright and vibrant being yellow, but it's the first thing my daughters, whose bedroom's right here, what they see every morning when they leave their bedroom. So I really hope it kind of pumps them up and inspires them. Let's go check out one of my daughter's rooms. So this is the smallest room of the house. And when we first went into it, I was like, oh my gosh, where am I going to fit a bed? Um, it's so small. And then we realized there was a little cubby area here, which is actually the perfect size for a single bed, which would be brilliant for my 10 year old daughter. So we custom built this bed. And of course, being cottage noir, it wasn't just going to be an ordinary bed. We decided to make it into a um, princess bed. So I got some, uh, you know, the curtains to be made into this kind of um, pull back here and at night time she closes them when she's feeling like she wants to be all snugged and snuggled up inside and then inside we've put a custom wallpaper now if you can see carefully it's actually lots of blanket and um, sorry lots of mattresses because it's based on the story of princess and the pea and sleeping under you know the the pea was underneath and the princess could feel it and so I hope it makes her feel like this is a princessy kind of bed um, decorating is a combination of her stuff <laughs> and my stuff, which you might be able to see the difference here. Um, I love this product in particular. It's a uh, um, uh, Manu Mermaid cushion, which is also available in the cornrow. Again, coming back to representation, I just wanted her to, um, to know that she can be anything, even a mermaid. And it was before the Little Mermaid movie came out with, um, with Halle um, Bailey in it. So we were there first and we, and we love it. And um, then, of course, the important storage at the bottom, because I think the best kind of design is when something's visually appealing, but also works and is useful. And so these two huge drawers underneath hide a lot of, <laughs> a lot of stuff, so it helps her room be uncluttered. Yes, my daughter, she definitely does have a lot of input and a lot of the soft furnishing she chooses. And then the color of the wallpaper. So we chose a particular kind of wallpaper, which reminded me of that tie and dye adire fabric that I told you about earlier. And she could have chosen any color she wanted that wallpaper. And she chose this kind of soft gray color. So that was great. So it kind of a way that I kind of was very much involved, but she felt like she had some agency as well. So being an ancient cottage, every room has a fireplace because, of course, that's how they kept their houses warm in those days. This fireplace, though, has been cottage noir. It's been put, a, I wanted a punchy colour on it, so we chose a green um, colour, so it kind of made a more feature of it. And then what she did, and she actually helped get involved in this as well, is we've put this kind of glitter paint over it. Um, so at night time, it really kind of sparkles as well, makes it kind of like a fun feature of her room.
So I love this picture. It's one of my favorite pictures of my daughters. And, and that, I don't know if they still do it now, but about 10 years ago, it was a real thing to do a cake shot of your daughter kind of let her eat her cake in her at her first birthday. And I love this picture. And we had to really convince her to eat the cake. Um, she's not so happy to have it. She thinks it's a bit embarrassing picture, but I just think it's the cutest thing. <laughs> I think one thing I think you should have, I don't like to be judgmental, but one thing I think is wonderful to have in kids' rooms is just lots of books. Now, if I was not myself, this would be lovely arranged beautifully, and it was when we first moved in. Now you can just see this is a very much lived-in bookcase because she's always taking books out, putting books in, sharing with her sisters. And we've got a wide range of books for children across the house. Again, you'll see a lot of the books have got the representation that I think is so important. This is one of our favourite. He's a black British historian called David. David Olusoga, he's amazing and he does these books for young children. And then we have a combination of fiction and non-fiction. And again, as I said with the bookshelves downstairs, it's great not just to have bookshelves, but to have little knickknacks here as well. So we went to Kennedy Space Center, she has something from there. They're always trying to beat their time on their Rubik's Cube. And then she has art that she's made herself. Um, because, you know, I, the best art, to go back to what I said earlier, is the things that your family make or what you create or what make, make meaning to you. So I think I'll never lose some of these little cutie things that she did at school. I think what gives home a soul is personal possessions. Yeah, that's why I feel like every home really should be individual. What makes it unique are the things that are unique to you whether it's your mementos you picked up on holiday or your favorite books that you have on the bookshelf or the postcards that you picked up at this exhibition you liked last week or you know things like that the, the, your own personal archive which i think shouldn't be stored away in ph photographic albums or in cupboards but should be displayed and enjoyed and that's what's you and that's what gives your home its soul this is my older daughter's room. Um, she has the same wallpaper as her younger sister. Again, she could choose whatever color she wanted as long as it was that particular wallpaper. And so she went to, for purple because it's her favorite color. Now the big argument that me and my daughter had in the room was about the bed. Um, because I fell in love with this bed um, at an auction site. It's an antique bed, kind of the same period as the house, so I thought it just matched it purposely, perfectly, and it just reminded me of a, like a fairy tale cottage bed. She loves it now, and it's super comfy, but I guess she wanted a new custom bed like her sister, so luckily I managed to win that battle. Again, I have a real love affair for curtains and stuff. I think that comes from my Jamaican heritage as well. And so we got these cus this custom um, curtain to go over it to give her that kind of more cozy, grand feeling. And then a lovely little flower print up the behi behind here. So that was really special. Again, my curls have a lot of input into what kind of duvet and the soft furnishings. They can choose that, so a lot of it is them. This is her favorite cushion, which her grandma made for her. And you can see it's all a bit dog-eared now, but she won't sleep without it. She had a fireplace as well. So this one was again, purple to give her the pop of color and glittery. And then all sorts of services. I always feel almost more is more. I just love it as an expression of the things that we collect and we love. And she has these African Russian dolls in her fireplace, which are great. I always thought Russian dolls, you can get Russian dolls of Dolls looking at dolls or looking like pets or looking like flowers, but I've just never seen a black woman on a Russian doll. So I actually commissioned some and to sell on the corner and then I had to have some on the, at home as well. So this is a lovely set of, of kind of African women Russian dolls that she has here. Um, Venus and Serena Williams, the sister's book, that takes pride of place. My girls play tennis too. And although I don't think they're quite Venus and Serena standard, it's lovely to kind of have that kind of parallel. And um, she has her 2022 vision board up that we did at the beginning of the year and <laughs> see how that is going. And just little thing, this used to be a hat when she went to a little prep school here. So we've kept that as a little piece of her personal history. These, my girls love these. They have so many of them, I have no idea, but whenever they have a, um, one a birthday or we go shopping, they always pick up another one. I think they're quite popular with the tweens in the UK. Let's head to my bedroom now. Hey, welcome to my bedroom. Um, so across the house, you saw, as I said, I kind of like a lot of things, a lot of energy, a lot of more is more. 
apart from my bedroom, <laughs> I've actually had my bedroom trying to be the most minimal zen room of the house because I really just kind of come in here to sleep. I don't even have clothes in my bedroom. I just really wanted somewhere that I just come and relax and unwind. So there's basically two big things in my bedroom. One is the bed, which I wanted to squeeze in the biggest bed I could, so it'd be maximum cozy. And this headboard, which I was really excited about, it's a friend designer of mine called Eva Shinaike. Um, she's a Nigerian British designer, and this is an ancient symbol of eternity. So I think that's lovely for kind of a bedroom, like a marital bed. And then of course the wallpaper, which I just love every time I see it. It's the cl it's clouds. It actually is wallpaper that had to be laid in a very specific way to get that kind of um, continual effect. And again, we wouldn't want to lie down sleeping in the clouds. The ceiling of this bedroom, a very pale blue color. I wish I painted more ceilings actually. I feel like it's a fifth wall that often gets ignored, but I just didn't want that kind of harsh white um, next to this wallpaper and I just wanted everything to be pale blue, which is what I did with the, the cupboard here and the bookshelf. And top here, you'll see what I was talking about earlier, the letter that my husband's family sent to, sent to my family asking for my hand in marriage. And so we've had it framed here and it's kind of a central part of the bedroom. And the, yeah, and then that's ba basically it. It looks out to the garden. I just wanted a calm room. I found a lovely, an Ikea actually, a lovely light fitting that I thought looked a bit like a cloud, which I thought was <laughs> worked well with my cloud theme. And yeah, just wanted it to be a restful, warm space. This is a sculpture that I picked up in Jamaica. It's actually a man and woman, kind of, at, it was their wedding day, so you can see they've sculpted the woman with her flowers there, looking adoringly at a very proud, recently made husband. And given that this is a room I spend with my husband, who I love to bits, I thought it was a lovely little representation of this. These light sconces are by a UK company called Puki. I wanted them, you know, as I said, I love reading. So it's a great way that I can kind of read and my husband can go to bed and switch off his one and I can have a bit of light. I wanted to get a nice shade of kind of blue that complemented the walls. And I just love this kind of brass fit. Okay, so come into this room, which is girls only, <laughs> girl gang, and it's my daughter's bathroom. So they got to choose the design of this bathroom. They wanted all very minimalist and zen and spa-like, which I was like, okay, you can. But I was allowed one cottage noir touch, which were these tiles that we put here by the bath. And these are one of the kind custom tiles made by a wonderful UK company called Balanaeum. And they were made for an exhibition I did at the Museum of the Home. And they're cameos of black women with different hairstyles and so it's very unusual, again, talking about representation, to see a tile of a, black, of, a, of a black woman or a cameo. So these are really special. The artist really did a great job in kind of showing different colors and different hair to, hairdos and this one and earrings and everything. So it's lovely when the girls in the bath to have this kind of visual imagery for them and adds a lovely warmth to this otherwise very aesthetic, because the girls love that word, aesthetic, bathroom. I think home to me um, is an exhale. <laughs> like, that's how I feel. Like, I think so much is going on in the outside world. Um, as a black woman, as just somebody who reads the news of what's going on right now, as someone, you know, the economy, there's so many stresses outside the door. And I just feel when I come in and close the door, I just want to, I just want to exhale and fill myself. It even happened today, I came in quite flustered. And as soon as I kind of got home, had my cup of coffee and everything, then my, I could feel my shoulders droop. And that's what I want for my family as well. It's our little solace, our safe space, and, and our place where we can kind of regenerate um, ready for tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Go to homeworthy.com for exclusive content and shopping guides.